Hey, it's Albert here. We're firing out podcasts like nobody's business lately. I've been recording like like crazy. We're doing two episodes a week. I probably record four a week just because we got some momentum going. And due to popular demand, we've got Jay Cav back. Jay, that is your camera just for reference and a reminder. You can look in mine if you want because you're also in mine. I Actually, look way better in this camera. Well, and they're to two totally different types of lenses. <laughs> No this one is probably better, honestly. It's okay. This is super wide just to kind of get you the feel that there's space here. Yeah. This and is relatively decent space. It is. Yeah, it is. The only issue, uh, it's leaking. We got a leak. We sprung a leak. And not only have we sprung a leak, we sprung a leak in like one, two, three, four different spots. So some, something happened. I don't know what to say to that. I have right? my friend Dylan coming over today and he's going to take some like silicone sealant to the top. And I, yeah. Yeah. I opened it up. The source after, of it. You know how it rained the other day, like for two days straight, like a monsoon? Yes. Oh. When I opened this thing up, it was just leaking oh. everywhere. That's what it was. Yeah. So I'm and sure we didn't black mold get... accumulated or something. Well, it might. But yeah, that we didn't get probably hit as hard as they did down south. But, you know. It when it rains here, worse. it rains a lot. And then we went yeah. to Cotton Hollow. I attempted to cold plunge. This was yesterday. <laughs> and it was white water rapids out there. I couldn't yeah. get in. I'd never seen it like that yet. The whole trail was washed out and it was flowing so fast that if I had jumped in, I would have been gone forever. <laughs> so we got Jake Hav back. Uh, Behindthebest.co. Yeah. Didn't even look that up again to remind myself. I just know now. It's the people and mindset behind the best athletes in the world. So we actually started off in moto, but we're moving into, I just interviewed a, a sports psychologist for um, uh, professional rugby teams. He also cool. worked with Manchester United um, cool. and has worked with uh, some pro golfers as well. So it was interesting to get, just want to get some variety because, you know, you think about nowadays um, athletes, you see athletes are like 15, 16 years old, even 12 that want to elevate. They want to get to the next level. And it's as much, you know, they always start with fundamentals. That's the key. What you teach is the key. And then eventually, you know, there's all kinds of things. There's heart rate. There's a woman who I can't wait to interview uh, who talks about heart rate variability yep. and what that means. And there's so much to that. Um, so, you know, and to be a better athlete, you would got to find that 1% everywhere. And so what I want to do is bring in a diverse group of people. We're going to interview a guy who um, helped the Quinnipiac team uh, with their sports performance win a championship. So cool. we want to diversify and really... Well, the root of all of it, really, or the root to the core of like how to learn any of it, it to me, is up here. Mm -hmm. it, it is. And I want to build more on the conversation we had last time we were in here. People liked it, got a lot of listens, got a lot of feedback inside of the app. People are starting to, at least inside the Moto Academy app, it's like a delicate introducing, right? Because if you go all, especially how much I've learned in the last few years, if I dumped it all on everybody. It's too much. No one would, I'd, I'd grab two people, yeah. you know? So it's like, I, I'm doing my best to very delicately kind of weave it into what we're doing at the Moto Academy. Mm -hmm. And it's catching on one person at a time it's it's catching on mm -hmm. i and because now i just have a core belief that it's it when you learn how to think you you can learn anything you can learn more quickly and way more effectively so if that's what people are trying to do inside the moto academy app there's a lot of people in the app now for the full 360 they want the community they want to learn how to think, they want to learn how to ride, fitness, nutrition, all of it. But there's some people that want to just get in there to just learn how to ride better mm -hmm. and just that one thing. But it makes you better at just learning that one thing way better. Yeah, and don't forget, it's not just the learning part, but it's also the execution part. Because I always yeah. say knowledge is the potential power, but how do you turn it into movement? How do you turn it into repetition? And that's the key. And I think, you know, if I was doing a one-on-one, -on -one, let's say you and I, were hired by some athlete and you said, all right, this person is paying you and I to get them results one day. I would be wanting them to take the skills that you have, that you share with them and do what I call like a thinking practice where let's say it's a, a turn track. So, all right, where you're going to talk about body position and standing up in turns. Okay, cool. Well, I know that they're going to feel uncomfortable and they're going to feel some resistance to the things that you want them to do. And so their body is going to want to go back to the comfortable state, which is the known, 
which is what they've always done. And if they do that, they'll continue to get the result they always have gotten. Mm -hmm. But if they want to break free from that and jump into that kind of growth zone, they need to get uncomfortable. And so you need to manage that feeling, but you kind of have to massage your way into it. And so you you have to be thinking, you almost have to like tell your body, hey, I know I'm going slower, but you're going to do this thing. Even though it doesn't feel right and it doesn't feel comfortable because it's just unfamiliar, you are going to do this thing. But you also have to have laps where you're not thinking. So you have to have the thinking lap where you're trying to apply the lesson, the learning, like you said, the learning piece and, and get through that. But then you also have to have reps where you test to see if I'm not thinking about it, how much have I adjusted? And like, if you told me that you wanted my, uh, if my foot was pointed here and you want it to be 45 uh, degrees in, it's probably gonna take me a while to get to 45, but at least if I can aim and have a target of 45 and I can think about it and try it and it feels a little uncomfortable, what will normally happen is you aim for the 45 and you don't hit it, but maybe you'll get to like 12, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe you'll get to 17, but either way, the 12 and 17 is greater than the zero you had. And so you keep kind of pushing and moving things because what you're basically doing is rewiring your nervous system really and the way your muscles respond, muscle memory, right? And it takes, can take a while it can take one day magically there's certain things that right it just like it clicks like a light bulb goes off mm -hmm. and then there's other things that and i'm speaking for myself at least where it seems like you gradually work towards something for a long period of time but then even then it has that one moment of like spontaneous oh ah, i get it now right yeah and it's interesting you talk about that because what because i haven't figured out what that moment is like i've explored it and what i find is that when something gives like either a dopamine hit or some sort of like elevated emotional response so like if you told me on how to go over a jump and let's say i'm one of those people that stays on the throttle or hits the throttle at the wrong time you mm -hmm. always coach hey when you're going off the face that's not when you add throttle you want to have your speed and modulate it and just just, it's so easy the way you coach it. You just launch off the jump. But um, if I was to feel what that felt like and felt that that feeling, that free feeling of going off the jump, not being in panic mode, not wondering what to do and feeling 100% confident that the advice you gave me is gonna work and then I go and I land on the downside just perfect. I think sometimes there's something about that emotion and how powerful mm. it is that may, that is related to how stickable, <laughs> the stickability of something or you know the assimilation of something into your body is. I think a lot of it relates to the emotion. And so with me, I'm a big vibe guy. I'm always focused on the emotion part and how you can move away from the emotions of guilt, shame, humiliation, embarrassment if you don't do a thing, because that will pull you the opposite direction. But then also really rewarding yourself and getting excited for the things that you do well, because it's gonna stick more if you tag it I almost think of like a price tag, like you're tagging it with a certain emotional signature. Mm. It, you have to be able to recognize that though, because if not, then you're just going to be experiencing a bunch of positive, a bunch of negative emotions and not understand what the heck's going on. But once you can recognize how powerful that feeling of doing it the correct way actually is, it's, you, you understand, you just like, I don't know. For me, I, it was like one day all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I can, I'm, I understand. And I know I still don't. I'm sure I still don't. But compared to before, three years ago, five years ago, seven years ago, <laughs> it's a miracle that I was even able to learn any, anything at all. Because qu quite honestly, like I was so stuck in, I was thinking of it this morning, we, Allie and I drove into Starbucks and why the heck did I think of it just as I turned into Starbucks? I don't know. Uh, oh, you know what it was? was a, a, Allie was playing a, a short little reel of Jordan Peterson talking about children that you should embrace and teach children to do dangerous things carefully, which is a really interesting way to think of it because it's so true. He's like, that's where you learn ultimately mm -hmm. teach children to do dangerous things carefully. And in my head, somehow I went from that to thinking about I want to remember this specific example because it would be so relevant to people. Um, thinking about uh, failures and things that I've messed up while doing dangerous things and how you can choose to either, it could either be a verb or a noun. So it, 
you can either have failed at that task or that specific situation or that specific day or whatever it is, or you are a failure. That's a huge, huge, huge difference. And, and then I took it from that to, I thought about, okay, what other things have I kind of labeled as my truths that were really just a, you know, a one-time occurrence or maybe a multiple-time occurrence that were not my truth at all? One of them was, uh, I'm not a good racer. I would say that all the time. And I believed it for years. I believed it for, if I've been pro for 15 years, I believed it for 14 of those 15 years of my pro career, that I was not a good racer because I would have a bad, a, a bad race, which probably guaranteed wasn't even a bad race. There was bad moments within that race, but I labeled it as bad races, which then I labeled it as bad seasons, which then I just turned into labeling it as me being a bad racer. Isn't it amazing how it morphed into that? It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you're onto something that's huge because I am statements are at the identity level. So you have a pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid is the foundation, almost like the foundation of your house. That's your identity. And your identity is always like the I am. And a lot of times if I ask you who you are, you might say, uh, most people answer, I am AJ Kanzaro or I am a professional motorcycle uh, racer, whatever, right? Um, But if you go deeper and think about who you are, you need to you need to go there because if you don't know, um, and you need to go there frequently. Sorry to interrupt oh, because you need if yes. you're not if you're not uh, reflecting, then you automatically subconsciously are slipping into these truths and these self images that you've created mm-hmm. automatically in the background without realizing it. And if you don't reflect all the time, and somebody asks you the right questions, or if you're smart enough to then ask yourself the right questions you'd be amazed at how bad some of your answers are. Yeah, and and I think the mistake that a lot of people make is what direction does your identity form? And so in the example you gave, you were letting external things in your external environment, your external world dictate who you were because you were, you. I am not a great racer came externally from the world telling you what you were. And there's something called the mirror principle. And so the mirror principle states that this is the exact thing you don't want to do. You want to swap it. Everything is a mirror. So you want to start, you don't want to look for your identity to be formed from the experiences externally. You want to identify what identity do I want to acquire or develop or build? And how do I project that externally into the world? And so the the easiest example is, you know, if you said, um, I, my one of my favorite examples, just because it's easy to remember, is um, oh geez, you know I, I haven't written a book. Like you said earlier, before we started the podcast, you said that you wanted to write a book. Well, are you a writer? You're not a writer. No. Or, well, it sounds like writer. <laughs> well, actually, no. If you had asked me that a little while ago, I would have said no. You would have said no. Now yeah. I would say, even though I haven't started yet, yeah, I've, I've started. I write down ideas all the time. So I've already started the process, even if it's at a small scale. So I would answer that question, yes. Okay, cool. Now, let's say that you didn't or someone didn't. And you can inject whatever you want. I am a writer. I am a plumber. It doesn't matter. Whatever you want to, to be. Then all you have to do is you think about, like, what are the, what's on the smallest things I can do, but on a regular basis, to create the evidence and proof that I am that person? What do writers do? Yeah, I think you did this last we podcast. About, yeah, right? yeah. So so you, you write, right? Mm-hmm. And so... Just write. And if you want to be a good racer, well, let, well let, let me challenge you on that one then. You know, if you wanted to develop the statement that I am a great racer, what would be something you could do to start creating the evidence to support that? Well, race and develop race specific skills. Yeah. What would be something super small that you could do? Super small that you could do within a day or so? Don't know. What? You Well, You'd have to figure that out, but I mean, well, yeah. <laughs> you, you want, but that's the whole thing is you have to think of like, what do those people do? Mm-hmm. And and so my next question to you would be something well, you like have this. to, you have to think it at least a little bit and then you have to believe it. And then you'll start. That's the hard part is going from like kind of f- forcing a thought, which is a bad way to describe it. Cause you don't want to force the thought, but you sort of do have to do some convincing t- to some level at first. And then once you start to believe something, then it's the mirror principle like you talked about, where once you believe something, the external world, all it's doing is then providing you examples to prove you right. 
Yes. So if you're a bad racer, guess what? You're going to find all the examples as to why you're a bad racer. Yeah, you'll filter out all the proof that says you are a good racer. And if you say you're a good racer, then you're you're going to look for all those little examples and mm -hmm. evidence that you are a good racer. So as soon as you tweak that mindset, to me, the pressure goes away and you start to look at you actually... you you don't even really recognize the issues and problems and failures and mistakes as those things. Mm -hmm. You just, you look at it from a different perspective and think about how, okay, simple, did this. I can, how can I fix that? Easy, I can do now do this instead. Mm -hmm. And now next time I've got this, this, and this that I can focus on. And guess what? I'm gonna level up 1% and be that much better of a racer. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this compounding momentum in your head Forget what the heck we were talking about five minutes ago, but well, he, well, I don't want to move away because I want to finish the thought because I think we're onto something. So let's go back to when I asked you, "Hey, what does a good racer do?" and you didn't have an answer. Here would be the next step. The next step would be who do you who do you believe is a great racer? Give me a name. Oh well, Jet. Jet. Okay. Give me one, two, three things, whatever you want. What, why is he a good racer? What, what skills and traits, characteristics, behaviors does he have that makes him a great racer? Uh, worries about himself and himself only at all times. Okay. Where you see other racers that very much do not do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, well, I think that's the biggest core one, to be quite honest. Because what if you worry about yourself and yourself <laughs> self only with kind of that growth mindset, you don't really feel the pressure. No. But there's other people you can see physically like tighten up. And it's like, oh my God, well, clearly that guy is feeling some sort of pressure and he's feeling that pressure because he's thinking about everything and anything but himself. Yes. And what is the main catch to that? It starts with the word C. It's, it's their uncontrollable things. If you worry about the track, you can't control it. So the worst thing is if I worried about the weather right now, that's a horrible thing to worry about because there's not a damn thing I can do. Right. And if you were, if I'm worried about you on the line, there's not a damn thing I can do about you. The only thing I can do is focus on myself. And so it's a very, um, it, it's, it's not a powerful position, right? Because you have no control over it. Right. And that's when we feel pressure and we feel stress is when we can't control things. Right. But to go back to the example, to finish the thought, um, what you want to do is start imagining like, okay, what are some, and this is the thing that people get wrong. They think that they have to actually do the thing. So in other words, you might say, all right, Jet um, doesn't worry about other people. All right, well, you need to find ways to not worry about other people and focus on yourself in the right situations. Obviously, you have a child and a wife. That's probably not the situation where, so then you could also develop a persona, right? So you right now as a father and a husband, have to focus on people other than you, right? But that's AJ Catanzaro, the, the father, the, the husband, right? But then you have another persona, which is a character role that you can enter into, which is I'm AJ and I, I like to make it fun. Like I have one um, athlete who's kind of quiet and shy. I call him the sa silent assassin. So we've developed this <laughs> persona that is not the same. Like he's super kind and, and cool in real life <laughs> off the track, but on the track, he has a different set of values. Like he doesn't care what you think of him, but at home he might think that, you know, and so he, he goes into that role once that helmet goes on, but you have to use your imagination to imagine situations and scenes where you can focus on just yourself because your brain doesn't know the difference between imagined and real. So if, if you're going to train yourself, what you do is you can still train your mind. If you get the movie playing clear enough and you're activating as many five of the five senses as you can, then you can actually start to develop the habit at least start, like start putting the groundwork down mm -hmm. for creating the habit of not focusing on other people. And who knows, maybe even in life, if someone gives you your opinion, be like, eh, whatever. But you you have to at least do something to start shifting and moving the needle, even if it's just 1%, but do it consistently, well, you know? That, that in my mind is the key, is, is taking that thought and that Im mental imagery beginning to try to visualize, which I, for the, I've talked about this the last few podcasts that I used to also, that was one of my truths. I didn't think that I could visualize. I read about visualization in a Jeremy McGrath book that I wrote, read, uh, wrote a long time ago. And I thought, oh man, that, you know, that'd be a cool thing to learn. That sounds cool. Tried it a, a few times, didn't know how to do it. And I sucked at it. And so I thought I couldn't do it, but everybody has the cap of capability to visualize everybody is at it is creative 
Whether well, you, they want to think it or not, everybody is creative. Well, yes, you were just using your imagination for the wrong things. You were imagining all the things that could go wrong. So your imagination has yeah. never been your oh, problem. Oh, and it was creative, all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would get the whole shot, and I tell you what, I thought, I've thought of every way that I could mess up a race. <laughs> every way. From flying off the track, to getting a tough block wrapped into my wheel, to colliding with somebody in the air, to getting landed on, to landing on somebody else. So sabotage. To the bike braking. Yeah. I mean, every way that you can possibly think to mess up a race once you've got a good start. Because I could get that part right. I could visualize the start and getting the whole shot and immediately it would begin to unravel in my head every time. So you're right. That's interesting. Never thought of it that way. And I've, I really, and that was another, you could ask yourself the right questions all day long and eventually you'll get there. Because that's another problem is I didn't think that I was creative. So we can keep digging down further to the root of this problem. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I was creative, so I didn't recognize the fact that it, all it was was just being creative in a different way. Just yeah. I just shift. Yeah, you were using a skill that you had for, it was almost like using a skill for bad instead of good. Yeah. It was like a bad cop versus good cop kind of situation. Man. Oh, I, you should, you would crack up if you knew some of the things that you, I would come dude, up with. Dude, I was at the races. Yeah. Trust Holy me. Holy cow. The only time and I ever drank a beer at the it. races when I was listening to you, you were telling me like, oh my God, AJ, what just happened? You're like, oh man, I got the whole shower, whatever you said. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, he's thinking the opposite. And it's like, that's where I got frustrated is that I just always saw that I knew that there was this- A glimpse this, of hope? There was a glimpse of hope because you're too smart. You're too creative. You have, you, you're you just, you're super personable. You have a lot of qualities that a lot of people don't have. And that's why- you know, I, I hung out with you and knew you when there wasn't even a Moto Academy. There wasn't even, I don't know, maybe you had 12,000 followers on Instagram. I don't mm -hmm. know, whatever, whatever yeah, it was. Probably. But but it wasn't until you kind of caught your stride and started realizing like, wow, oh, wait, there's this whole power that I have that I can tap into the mental game. And you started exploring it. So realize that the number, if you said, in my opinion, what do you think is the one thing that sparked your change? It would be one word. It would be curiosity. Yeah. You're like, well, wait a minute. Is there a different way to do things? Yeah. Is there something or another C whole... word like conscious, being conscious yes. and observing what that idiot subconscious was had come up with and developed over the last 30 years just due yeah. to malpractice and that was it. Yeah, and most of those were lies too, right? You know? Oh, they're all lies. So think yeah. about it. It's but it's only a lie when you become conscious. Because everything else, so think about it. You you were telling yourself lies, but you believe them as truths. It was because you were asleep and you just bought into that was who you were. You bought into the identity of I'm not a great racer. So then then when you made mistakes, it was like, oh, there's a validation. So like that's the trap is if you believe you're not a good racer, that's identity level. That's strong. Well, you get ultimately if you have the wrong truths, you're you get in my opinion, you would get stuck at that bottom level of the pyramid. Right. It mm -hmm. doesn't even allow you to. I guess you can kind of, you could go up the pyramid in the total wrong way. But once you form the bottom, is it, what was the person's name? Matt, it starts with an M, this pyramid thing. Oh, I don't. No, I was just, reading about it yesterday. Oh, I know. It, well, all of, I, it's, I have my own pyramid. Everyone just takes the pyramid concept and does their Here, own. Let me Google this it. person and see if it's in alignment with yours. Whatever Sorry. Is, Matt. What, yeah. While you're doing that. So another thing that you mentioned too, that I want to circle back to while you're looking them up is think about when go ahead you got it i got it real quick first try yeah go ahead maslow's pyramid oh maslow's hierarchy of needs yes yeah it's that's sort of a little the bit... same idea so the base level oh no this is a little different it's a little different the base level of this one is your physiological needs so yes. yeah, you're breathing your food your water if you don't have those and you're not getting to that next level of isn't sex on the bottom one nope clothing well i mean it might be but water shelter clothing sleep they foundation didn't... level if oh, you can't okay. get if you don't have don't those have needs those, yeah. met, you just, you're certainly not leveling up consciously to that next next ring, yeah. which is safety and security. So this is where most people end up at, right? Which is uh, employment, family, social uh, ability, mm -hmm. health, your job, all of that, safety and security, money. Yeah. A lot of people get stuck right there. Next level up is love and belonging. That's friendship, family, intimacy, sense of connection. Next one up is self-esteem, confidence, achievement, respect of others, the need to be a unique individual. And then the top one is self-actualization. So morality, creativity, spontaneity, acceptance, experience, purpose, meaning, and inner potential. Yes. And that's where so you're kind like, of exploring right now. Yeah. According to this, like I've now you reach that top ring of the pyramid, so to speak, and then you 
you can actually, you can think clearly, you can be a good person because you're not constantly like self-preserving. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm still selfish. Everything I do is, and th- I think everybody, I would argue that everybody is selfish because even if you're giving and you know how the world works and how like physics works, like you have to give to receive. So yeah. selfishly, you know, there's selfish act in that even. Uh, but you can, your morals are so firm that you just, the byproduct is you become a good person, which is quite nice. Yeah. Well, you could also argue is selfish a bad thing. Think about it. You've been selfish maybe with your time a little bit in the last couple of years with your relationship in that you've been flying around doing all these things. But then as a result of that selfishness, assuming that that's a bad word, there's been a lot of positives. You live in a nice house in a great area. You've been able to provide for a fa- you know your family. You've been able to provide not just for your own immediate family, but probably even distant family. You know, like your dad. Not, not that that's distant well, my, family. My but in, eight employees. Your families. own employees. Yeah, you've been you've been able to be a provider because you've had to be selfish. And so I would even challenge the word selfishness and say that maybe it's not that bad. Now it depends on your agenda. What do you do with that selfishness, right? Is your selfishness used for good or bad? And in your mm. case, it's always been used for good. I don't think you've ever used selfishness. Like I've never seen or heard you say anything bad about anyone. That's even when interesting. You found the right so that word has so much negative connotation for it's no reason. No, it's just the the you hear everybody else talk about selfishness at like the subconscious level of like. Uh, this guy's an a-hole, like he doesn't care about anybody but himself. But really, you're exactly right. You have to be selfish to be able to get to the top of the pyramid Mm -hmm. and have all of the things Mm -hmm. to be able to be a a conscious individual. I think, by the way, one of the questions that came in, Mm -hmm. asks, uh, and I'll play it here shortly, thank you guys for sending your questions in, is at I use the term high level, which Allie hates. She's starting to hate it less because I don't, again, I think there's negative connotation to that term too, or people misconstrue what I or a person would mean when they say high level. Nothing has meaning till you give meaning to it. But so when I say high level, I am quite literally just referencing like somebody that's a, that's conscious. Mm-hmm. That's it. Because again, like once you're conscious, you make the right decisions, you have good morals, you you know how to learn, you know how to think, and you're high level. And there's levels to that. There's people that are conscious a lot, like with an Eckhart Tolle. Mm-hmm. Dude, it's unbelievable. He'll just be talking to a YouTube video and pause for 30 seconds. Like, um, oh, you ever watch it. those videos where you're like, did he just die? Dude, I had an out of body, my first out of body experience was falling asleep to one of his videos. Oh, really? And then I woke up freaked out because I, I, I almost feel embarrassed to even say this because I'm like, people are probably just like, this guy's crazy. But I swear to God, I was about six feet off the ground. It, and I, obviously, it wasn't real. I don't think your body can do that. But I felt as if I was. And I heard his voice saying like, you might be have, some of you are going to have an out of body experience. And I heard that. And then I realized I was having it and I freaked out and then I woke up. Wow. That dude's no joke. There's levels to it. There's so so level. He's the power of now, by the way. So if you guys are all about the present moment, which is a great place to explore as well. um, He's the go-to guy for that. And he's- It all ties in. That book is so, I put that in the top three books that of importance, at least uh, that I've read so far, because it, it, it all ties in, but that- it's really the one of the roots of like the whole deal, the whole thing. It's so interesting to me. What were we talking about before that? There's so many great things to talk about. We I need know. to go back to Eckhart because the power of now is a big, big concept. Should we just go there real you quick? Know what, yeah. Well, let's let's there was let's a question. question okay. And then because this yeah, is gonna we'll tie go in too perfectly. Okay. This question's from King Friday, by the way. Shout out King Friday. King Friday, I like it. Should have loaded these ahead of time. Whoopsie Daisy. Hey Jake, King Friday here. Uh, sorry about the camera angle, driving. Um, listening to your podcast, I heard you describe somebody again as being high level, and I just wondered if you could clarify a bit what high level means to you. Um, I think it's often followed up by how much money somebody has, but I think there's got to be more to it than financial success. Um, I'd love to hear you riff on that a little bit more. Thanks. I think that's a great question. And I think that it's, I'd be curious to know what everybody or the majority of people's perspective on when they hear that term would be. Do mm-hmm. you think that when uh, people say high level, where does your head go? Or does it depend who's saying it? It depends. It depends on who's hearing it. 
Because like I said, I mean, the, the, the craziest thing is think about any word that you use in any language. Like you, you have to know what it means. Like you're, you're, you're taught what it means. There's some sort of meaning that's applied to it. So a word doesn't have any value or any meaning until you add meaning to it. Even with experiences in your life, like whatever happens, like a lot of things, a lot of times people think something happens to them. Well, what if it happens for them? Right? So all I did was sw switch the meaning, right? So like, let's say to give you an example of how I would answer that question is if I go to a track and all of a sudden things did not go my way, did the race happen to me or to happen for me? Because if it happened to me, I'm a victim, right? So if I just label that race, let's say a race weekend, just nothing went my way. I expected to be top five and I got 20th the whole weekend. Well, um, the meaning I placed on it now, because of my perspective and meaning, uh, forces me into a victim mindset. So now all of a sudden that whole experience has a completely different value than if I changed the meaning to it and said, well, this happened for me. And now all of a sudden I have 11 things, 11 bullet point things I can work on after doing a debrief with myself. I realize there's 11 areas or five or two, even if there's one areas that I can work on. Now that same exact experience completely changes because I changed my perspective and the meaning I place on it. And now all of a sudden I've got some tools or some opportunities I can focus on to become a better athlete next time I go to the track. Not only is the difference, is there a difference <clears throat> between thinking and believing that the things are happening for you and not to you, the for you, things happening for you is not only a higher level, I'm talking, it's thousands of levels above it's like things happening to yeah. you. It's not, it's infinite levels above mm -hmm. because it's a completely, completely, completely different wavelength that you're on. Somebody saying things are happening to me, it's a victim, period. Allie and I, I hate this. She made me watch right before we went to bed your six sit my 600 pound life have you ever watched that where it's about 600 pound people that are trying to lose weight they go to this uh like indian doctor who is the sweetest guy and he does a surgery to make their stomach smaller they have to lose a bunch of weight or they do lose a weight a bunch of weight right off the bat then he kind of coaches them through trying to lose as much as they can and the, the person that was on last night and most of them that's how they get there in that situation in the first place they're victims everything is happening to them everything even things that like are so obvious to me as i'm watching it, like that was a great thing that just happened to you they're looking at it, ah that just happened crap they're looking at only seeing the negative it's unbelievable so uh, to tie that back into that question obviously jay and i are in a similar wavelength like speaking of wavelengths i sent robbie madison a message and said i love just kind of love what he does i think he's hyper creative and think he's awesome and I would love to do a team trip uh, to California. And with that, like, I thought it would be amazing to be able to meet him and for my team to learn how to do like backflips with him teaching us. I thought it was a cool concept. And he responded with a voice message. I just sent a text. He responded with a voice me message right away. He said, uh, AJ, would absolutely would love to have you. I've been following your stuff. He goes, I just saw a video of you sitting in the, doing a cold plunge, reading Think and Grow Rich. And he goes, I I." Just by watching that video, I could tell you and I are on the same frequency, is what he said. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing how you start attracting those right people. But anyways, high level versus low level, you and I, Robbie Madison, guys on a slightly higher level are referring to conscious, being being really highly conscious individual. Not The money has nothing to do with it. The money, again, is a byproduct. I think that a lot of people are able to make money uh, by being unconscious human being and by being kind of a, a bad person, <clears throat> just by like the law of averages, it's just going to happen. You're going to have those situations, but, and it's also more than likely that person, their money is going to be short lived and their money is also, uh, the thing that they're chasing. So th that's a horrible way to think you're not going to be a, uh, you're not going to be a person that experiences joy if you're if the end goal is the dollar, that's a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. So I would consider that person, even if they had a billion dollars, to be low level. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I ask you something about chasing? If yeah. you're chasing something, is it running towards you or is it running away from no, you? No, because you don't have it, so you're keeping it in the future. Or you, th yeah. You're well, creating time in between the thing that... If, time and distance. It's just like if you're chasing it in your mind, if you, that's why when people like pray or try to manifest or whatever it is, like there's a very big difference between like saying, oh, I want this and I want this and this. It, that's not what praying, if you know how to pray or like being able to kind of like visualize and 
and manifest, mm -hmm. you, you're simply supposed to visualize the thing and then cre attach and create the feeling with that visualization and the imagery that you're living the experience. So therefore it already exists. It's not way somewhere out in the future. You're mm -hmm. experiencing that thing as if it's existing right now. So sorry, this is gets so off top, not off topic, but just hold, hold on. Cause we're jumping all over the place. Yeah. There's so many good things to talk about. <laughs> uh, my morning routine. Mm -hmm. Um, can I talk about it for a second? Of course, because this gonna, is your van. It's going to tie this whole thing in. <laughs> it's your van. <laughs> so, and by the time I tie it in, I'm going to forget about what I was tying in. So sorry. <laughs> Morning routine. First of all, do you remember what you told me last time we were in this van? Yeah. Uh, two things. What? Well, okay. What were they? One, um, what feeling do you want to experience that day? And what version of yourself needs to show up in order to experience it? Oh, so going Before up to bed at night oh, and then oh. waking up in the morning, yes, what, yeah. there was something that you told me the, to take it a step further. Yes, uh, it was probably this. To marinate in the feeling of gratitude, the receiving emotion before you go to sleep. Was that it? No, no, no but that's a great one. Gee, what was the hell not, did I tell it you? It was not bringing my phone up. I oh, said, yes, I don't go on my yeah, phone before yeah. bed. I just put it upside down on my nightstand. And you said, well, one step further. Can you just leave it? downstairs yeah, yeah that's right it's been downstairs ever since really? yeah right. yeah it does help doesn't it yeah it's just another level up to that it's so what it does is it buys me a little bit of extra time before bed of of not being on it or and mm -hmm. also uh kind of navigating or getting away from the risk of or the chance of me accidentally yeah. getting on it mm -hmm. and then in the morning same thing it keeps me off it for an extra i don't know 10 to 15 minutes probably and then mm -hmm. it it also lowers the risk of me accidentally hearing it vibrate or lighting up or something and I grab it because it's out of sight, out of mind. So morning routine now starts with night routine. Phone stays downstairs on the island. Phone goes on the island at like seven. So Allie and I wind down. We have another hour and a half downstairs where nothing is being done on that phone for that hour and a half. Then we go up to the bedroom and we hang out more. Like she'll take a bath with Millie or I'll take a bath, bath with Millie and then we'll go to bed right now. 10 30. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of time off the phone before you go to bed. That's important. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't watch 600, my 600 pound life before, <laughs> bed. but that's a different story. <laughs> Waking up, I, uh, phone is nowhere to be found. I walk downstairs. I open the door so Bear can go outside. I shut the door. I then pour myself a bottle. This is an 18 ounce bottle. I, I would like a bigger one, I think. And I mix a half to three quarters of a packet of Element. And as of this week, also one scoop of creatine into my water and I drink the whole thing. So that's the very first thing I do. Then I immediately walk outside. And there's another level I could take to this too. My shoes are on. I think my shoes should probably be off even if it's cold. If you want to get technical, uh, you can be more grounded. <laughs> if you want to get a little higher level with it. Yeah. So I walk outside with Bear and you've seen the my backyard is beautiful i can walk along like an apple orchard and then mm -hmm. there's a there's a gate at, to another farm way at the far end so i walk all the way to the gate i then turn around and sun is perfectly up mm -hmm. over the mansions up on the hill mm -hmm. and i will stare into the sun i'll shut my eyes and this is kind of a whole different like meditation method i'll look up 45 degrees which if there's something to that apparently it helps you go drop down into different wavelengths mm -hmm. And I then do what I've learned by reading a book called The Silva Mind Control Method. Yeah, Jose Silva. It's just the meditation induction essentially is what it is to bring you down into like from beta to alpha. And then if you're really good, like gamma or theta. Um, so I count from 50 down to zero. That's basically his induction method. And once you practice it, he says that you can then get down. So like step one for the first few weeks is practicing from 50 to zero. Then you go from 25 to zero, then 10 to zero, and then you can do it from five to zero. And you tie it in with something physical. So he says you tie it in with touching your, your thumb to your pointer finger, and then you count from five to zero, and a really high level person that's good at meditating can drop into that in five seconds. And so with that, you can get to, you can remember anything, because as, as long as you were there, or even if, this is a different hole. This is another level. Even if you're not there, it's all connected. You can remember that thing. That's what psychics are. I believe that that exists because it's somebody that can access a certain thing. I'm sure a lot of TV shows you see in that crap is one. Um, there's probably people that aren't 
legit. But I'm sure that there are people that are legit because it's all connected. Anyhow, what the heck are they talking about? You count from, right now I'm counting from 50 to zero because I'm still a novice. Mm-hmm. 50 to zero, when I get to zero, um, I feel I feel like I could take a nap, but not quite. That's kind of where you want to be. Mm-hmm. And then I just visualize whatever I feel like visualizing that day. So this morning was, um, oh, is that just visualizing our, uh, like a future home? Mm-hmm. And I was, I I work on these visualizations all the time. So like that home is, I know that home. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, you already see it. You oh, that it home, it's like. detailed. Yeah. I could I could walk you through it. Yeah. Like really, really, really detailed. <laughs> and I, I combine that with just a feeling of gratitude already. Like I can open my eyes for a second and scan where I am right now. And some people, like that's a privilege. Where I scan now is unbelievable. It's a dream home. You know what I mean? But I can look further up that hill and see the mansion and just like it's I can see it and I feel really grateful and I close my eyes again and I'm visualizing that future home so that's what manifesting is um and then I jog back with bear feel really really good and then still once I get back inside I will then eat breakfast and read this morning I was started rereading the power of now and then I'll go on my phone Mm -hmm. imagine imagine that process versus the very easy alternative to which I once did forever. Alarm goes off. Alarm goes off. By the way, when that alarm goes <laughs> off, I had a conversation. Uh, he probably won't mind me saying this. That I had a conversation with my friend Dom the other day, and I was talking about th- that exactly. Mm-hmm. And uh, I go, man, do you, th- again, this is could be considered a privileged thing to say, but I don't like that either. Because if you're calling somebody privileged and that's just you're telling yourself that you can't do it or you can't i mean everybody could do this correct yeah it might take some time to be able to work towards it but everybody could have the the privilege of not having to set an alarm uh so that's part of my morning routine i don't set an alarm but if you do have to set an alarm make sure that it's not a tone that makes you want to kill yourself as soon as you wake up dom goes aj as soon as my alarm goes off i just want to i'm just so pissed off and I'm so angry. And I'm like, that's how you're waking up every morning, dude? Yeah. You're joking about it, but that's not good. It's mega not good. <laughs> that's the least good thing ever. Because I obviously, what the heck is that day going to look like after you wake up pissed off to that stupid same alarm? It's a stock iPhone alarm. Horrible. Mm-hmm. It's the worst sound ever. Like, uh, whoever's in charge of Apple now, change that alarm. <laughs> Allie has an alarm that when we do need to use one, it is waking up to like chimes and peaceful like birds in the background <laughs> and it gets gradually louder and louder so you'll yep. hear it mm-hmm. but it's nice it's really nice you yeah. wake up to something nice you get to w- wake up instead of have to wake up you yeah, can see where that of, there's those two <laughs> <laughs> it's just like what the well you know what's crazy the, did you ever notice this i wonder if you ever noticed this we both go to the same gas station down the road yeah. the mobile gas station go in and buy something next time you go and it'll never leave your mind now is when you go in the process for like using your debit card is, is way too involved but when it's time to remove your card successfully you've made payment you're a customer the ultimate reward for you it's this sound that sounds like this it's like bah, bah, bah. and i'm like oh yeah and it's such a negative sound i'm like did my card work yeah it worked y'all yeah Wait, what? And it's so funny <laughs> that I literally think that I need to get a different card. When it first happened, the first couple of times, I was like, I can give you cash. They're like, no, you're all set. And then next time, oh, no, you're all set. And then I'm like, oh, my God, it's the tone. The Isn't tone is so negative. That's the card, when the, the insert card reader tone, when yeah. it works, it totally sounds like a tone that... Insert card reader, that yeah. That card failed. Yeah, it sounds like... I'm like, dude, I want to hear... I want to hear Allie's tone. I want to hear... Thank you, Jason. <laughs> like some OnlyFans girl being like... Thanks, Jay. Your purchase is complete. <laughs> By the way, you should be able to edit that for your own. You should be able to personalize your card so that when you do that scan it, it's sick. got a personalized, you know, thank you to yourself. For- I like that. Or it could go the other way. If you're saving for a house and you haven't done a good job about it, be like, dude, really? <laughs> yeah, really, bro? Right. Really, bro? Depending on what the purchase is <laughs> exactly. and how much it is, exactly. it, it either validates you or it yells back at you. <laughs> exactly. That's a great idea. Somebody should coin that. Yeah, if anyone wants to go into business, uh, reach out to AJ. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And, you know, I tell you what, operating at that level, to elaborate further on the King Friday question, 
the you you can uh, that level the scale is infinite so you know like the bottom of the tier are victim mentalities the bottom of the tier are uh people that think things are happening to them constantly the, it, mm-hmm. it's a person stuck in traffic and reacting to the traffic and flipping somebody off it's um there's so many levels to it that's why it's a good way to describe it because mm-hmm. There, there's infinite levels to the low level person as well. Um, can you think of other obvious examples to, so I can continue to just draw this image for people? For a, a low level person, like uh, how, how is a low level person reacting? Give, give me examples. Well, first of all, in modern I walk time- outside right now and I, the, the freaking, <laughs> the, the stupid sump pump that has nowhere to dump to just dumps on the driveway and I step on it and guess what? It's partially frozen right now. So it's the slipperiest thing of all time. And I slip and I fall on my back. All right, let's There's consider- a low level way to react to that. And there's a higher level way to react to that. I like it. Okay. Right? So let, yeah, let me give you my version. So I'm going to give you my low level version of what I see in your front yard. Okay. I'm looking out in your front yard and I'm seeing that the trees look kind of bare. And then this tree right here. This is the low level version? This is low level. Okay. It looks like this could maybe be trimmed. And I don't know, but now that you point it out, like that water in the driveway in the middle is really bothering me. It's the high level version of me is realizing, and it's so funny that that's what I saw. Yeah. I looked for trouble. I literally, all mm-hmm. I did just now is I looked for problems and I looked for trouble and I found it. Now I'm gonna shift to I don't like, I'm going to agree with Allie. Okay. I'm not a big fan of high level. I'm just a fan of like, persp- just simple perspective. Like, or, I'm and, try- to me, I literally picture a, a ladder and I picture the ladder of improvement and getting to the higher level of change. But then again, you could look at it as just like, because it is kind of black and white. It's either you're, you're looking at this from the perspective of, of good or you're looking at it from the perspective of bad, kind yeah. of. Most people call it self-actualization, but that word's pretty hard to say. I even struggle with it myself. But to go back to this example, if I look now as a AJ Catanzaro high-level thinker, I see, I actually see, I think it's cool, like the um, the shadows of the trees. Oh, it's beautiful. It's the really, really cool. Through the leaves, even. You could look at the leaves as a nuisance. I think the leaves are look great. The color, the orange reminds me of fall. It brings me back, like, nostalgia looking at the leaves. The red barn across the street. Like, everybody like wants red a red barn. Yeah, and they they sell really cool little trinkets. And you can just walk in. It's it, awesome. It, dude, literally, and have they, you ever done it? There's right? never anybody there, so it's like an honor system. Yes. So I, know, I don't know why, but I haven't done it. You have to do it. So there's eggs. Lily, AJ, if you're looking outside of the moto van in AJ's driveway, you will see a small farm little stand. farm stand. And you just, it's honor. St- and you go in, there's lights in there. It's like beautiful. It's cool. It's beautiful. Yeah. You go in there and it's like, you want some eggs? Leave a couple bucks. You want an apple? Hey, leave 50 cents or a buck, whatever it is, That's right? Great. And so what if you, and so what? what's the learning lesson here is if you look for trouble, you'll find it. If you look for good, you'll find it because that becomes your filter. Your focus is your filter. So if you focus on looking for problems and you do that from a victim mindset, you will find plenty of problems. The world's coming to an end. We watched some horrible movie last night. Oh really? my God. Hey, I don't even, I don't even want to say what it Was is. Was it with Julia Roberts? Yeah. Uh, Dude, don't watch traumatizing that. Traumatizing kind of movie. It's yeah. worse than the 600 it's, pound. It's really well shot. It's a well done, well it made movie, I thought. You uh, did see it. Yeah. Okay. And I don't watch much TV either, but yeah, I just watched that. Yeah. yeah. We just watched it last night. Yeah. But so. The ending pissed me off, but was super creative at the same time. Yeah, I, I like endings. Like, I want to know the ending. I don't want to have to figure out the ending on my own. Like, don't let me think about it. Yeah. Like, I was here to, like, check out. And now you're making me think. The whole reason I watched this movie was to not think. Because I don't have a problem with thinking. I have a problem with not thinking. That is a good movie in the sense that it's, like, obviously um, symbolization of a whole bunch of different things. Right? Yeah. I think the person that created that is definitely high level. Because you can kind of, if you watch it with the perspective that I watched it from, it's you're thinking about the psychology of people and the you know the not the civilization but the the culture that we live in now and how let's offer some backwards it is let's offer some context this movie is essentially julia roberts and some other i can't picture the one guy's name ethan Um, Ethan hawk yeah Yeah. and there's another man i can't remember how to pronounce his name looks kind of like ethan hawk yes and so (laughs) oh well no that's um kevin bacon yes there's another gentleman too who's considered yeah. the second character, main yeah. character. But anyways, it's about the the end of the world, essentially, right? And the world coming to an end and all the things that we think might happen. But um, I would argue that the, the I, 
Could 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 you see my whole... perspective if I told you that I think that the director was low level? And he was low level because he was thinking of all these things that he has no control over. And he's low level because all it did was make me feel fear. All it did was induce, it's going to induce fear in people who don't think clearly and who buy into narratives. There's going to be a narrative that is now installed deeper and wired even harder into their mind that the world is going here. And if Julia Roberts think that this is what's going to happen, well, then it's probably what's going to happen. But the premise of the movie was that the attack on the United States that was happening was a planned attack by somebody that said, we're going to do this, this, and this. There's like three steps to it. And the, the third step was that people would become so desperate and self-preserving. It was like a psych, it was like a psychologist way of looking at it, that they would then turn on themselves, AKA civil war. So that it would be a hands-off way and an inexpensive way for us to be able to sabotage an entire country by just doing the step one and step two. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the steps I think was isolate. So they were they were like blocking off the highway. So people were yeah, were lack isolated. of transportation is a cyber attack. And then the I forget what the other one was. And then it created the so I would say I thought that was high level because I was just thinking, wow, this um, director or whoever is creative enough to think of how that psychology works and that 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 would actually work in today in culture. If you did that to the United States. We're having a civil war. Yeah. And let, let's say we brought it back to a triple jump. Let's bring it let's bring it all the way back to a triple jump. <laughs> if we bring this back to a triple jump, like what what could what like so how could you use some oh, of this knowledge? Great. So I want to hear you I want to hear your thoughts. So bring me so This is I why I'm a good teacher now, because I can walk anybody through yes. this process and I can say it differently depending on if it's a six year old kid or a sixty year old guy to try to make sense of this. At least I think. Let's hear it. So there's there's two ways to look at it. And you can ask the right questions to anybody and get to the root of where their fear is and then uh, write their fear off usually as just irrational. So there's a way to look at that triple and, and to think about all and visualize all of the ways specifically that it could go wrong or maybe not even, maybe you have a general view of that. Maybe you're, you just have feet, you know, actually this is the truth. Most people just have fear. Most people are afraid to do that uh, a, a jump with a gap in the middle. Why are they afraid? Well, most people don't even really ask that question and even get that far. They, but they're afraid. They're deeply afraid. And they, they, their heart will race. Their palms will sweat. Their, their breathing will get shallow. So they're, they're so afraid that they have an emotional reaction. Uh, and then if you ask the question, why are you afraid? Okay, usually that's where I start. And they'll say, uh, oh, I'm afraid to crash. Okay, fair. But uh, what? In what specific situation do you do you visualize yourself crashing? Like how? What do you mean? What are you specifically afraid of with crashing? Um, I I don't I don't have one. Okay, well, boom, right there. It just took me two questions. I just got to the root of your problem. It's an irrational fear. So now don't be afraid, and instead you can think about an actual game plan and things that you can control. And uh, if, if, do you want to go long or short on this jump? There's always mm -hmm. usually a safer option. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do go long, what are you going to do? What are the steps you're going to take? If you do go short, what are the steps you're going to take? Create a game plan and you can weigh that risk to reward very logically. And then once you decide that this jump is within my comfort zone to be able to, uh, to do, you have a game plan to do it, guess what? You're not afraid anymore. But if you want to get to another step of that, uh, you ask why. They say, I'm afraid to crash. Fair enough. Let me ask you the next qu next question. Uh, can you tell me specifically how you're afraid to crash? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid of... Um, it's a steep landing. I'm afraid to overshoot it and just land completely on the flat. Okay. So why not then? What happens if you come up short on the, that jump? Well, it's a big ski jump landing. I really could land... 40 feet short, short and be totally fine. Okay, now we figured it out. Go short by a little bit. Go short by a little bit. Because if, and then if you, if your answer is go short by a little bit and you don't feel confident that you could uh, jump within a 50 foot range to not hurt yourself, then you've got to the, the rational explanation of I shouldn't do this jump yet because I'm not there yet. Or you get to the decision of, okay. Don't go long. I've got a 50 foot window to go just a tad bit short. Once I land there a few times, then I can jump five feet further. I'm at my downside. I've accomplished the jump. 
it's a really, really logical, straightforward way of looking at something that's high level in my opinion, or the generalization for to some level generalization of I'm just afraid. And you can, you can work yourself through that in anything on a dirt bike track, <laughs> anything, because that would be the one argument is, uh, it is motocross is a difficult place to, to be a high level thinker because you're constantly provided with like reasons why you like short term failure type situations, right? Mm -hmm. You get beat by this guy, you get beat by this guy, you get beat by the whoops one lap, like some <laughs> the whoops are, you're not going to get them perfect every time. Like, you know what I mean? They're, somebody passes you, like you're constantly being provided with proof as to why you're, you've failed or little small failures along the way. Um, but if you break it down to the root of each individual one, you can move past it. And it, again, no idea what we were talking about. No idea. The no other idea. Now, let me ask you this. <laughs> when it comes to fear, let's say, I want to hear how you advise on this. Now, let's say that I go to hit that triple jump and let's say I decide to go long and let's say I either go too long or too short. Either way, the outcome is not what I had expected. Um, how do you advise people to manage that very moment when things don't go well? Now, I'm not saying they crashed because that's there's only one way to manage that. But like, let's say you didn't experience what you thought was going to happen. Um, how do you manage that very moment? Um, so I, we had somebody do this shout out local A class at uh, my class in Arizona. He's an app member. He drove eight or nine hours from California just shout to go to class. Out. Yeah. Really? Oh, wow. And he, I think I talked about this on another podcast briefly, so I'll keep it short. But and right in the warm up, there's a massive tabletop that's super steep that you don't want to overshoot. And I turn, and he's just flying through the air, long past the landing. And I'm like, oh god, got a big gas tank. Like this is a bike made for off road. It appears not a bike you want to be jumping a big tabletop long that like I wouldn't want to overshoot. And I hear him yell as he's in the air. <laughs> lands perfectly by the way and rides out and is fine like it looks slightly shaken up but it was fine so that's a great example mm -hmm. right i mean so you then have a way that you can respond to that you can either be angry at yourself for messing up something that i think was actually a pretty easy thing to avoid and i'll explain why mm -hmm. Or you assess the you just run the situation back, which is very productive if you do it in a productive way. And you can think about the things that you did well, which in his situation was he overshot it perfectly. He got the bike totally flat. And right before he landed, he got his head forward and he accelerated. So it dropped the back end just a tad. So he landed barely back tire first, kept super strong legs. So like he definitely used all of his body suspension. Uh, but it was, he did it perfect, really. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have done it better myself. So that's the good thing. The the negative, not even not the negatives, but the things that he can improve upon next time are very obvious. He, he didn't judge the situation and put enough thought into the initial kind of game plan. It was a jump that you can go short on all day long because it was like a, a knuckle that kind of knuckled and mm -hmm. it just... It was, you could land in a 40 foot range and be completely fine. So what do you really want to do is just take it one step, one step, one step. And next thing you know, you find yourself at the downside. So once he did that and worked himself through that process, you find the, what caused the root of the problem. You can fix it next time. You have a plan of attack for next time. Yeah. Right? Really easy way to work yourself through that. Well, yeah. I mean, had, in, so a couple of things I always think I used of. to do the opposite. Well, yeah. Well, the whole thing is, is it people in, this is not something unfamiliar to people, but failure is feedback, right? It's feedback that what you did didn't work, right? Your intention or what, what you did, even not even your intention, because your intention obviously wasn't the issue, the execution of that, which needed to happen in order to reach your attention wasn't executed properly. But I think a lot of times people don't look at failure yeah, the right on. way. I'm so sorry. Let me, yeah, go this guy came yesterday. I don't know. He's trying to sell us freaking solar panels or something. Can I just tell him? I'll go this way. Hey, no. Yeah, we're going to cut. You know this guy? No. no. Okay. We don't want solar panels. Unless he can install them right now and heat up this van. 
Sorry, so gonna... there was a brief intermission. Uh, the band got cold. Also, somebody was knocking on our door. We're back. Um, I want to keep talking, yeah. but I figured that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought you only went to one country. Uh, you went to a whole bunch. Where, if you were to buy, if you were to live there, do you know which country you would pick? I kind of like Off Spain because I speak pretty decent Spanish, but then Switzerland caught my eye and my love and that's where one of my professional athletes lives and he he actually already offered for me to oh. go out there and work with him within his business and so i actually declined the offer and i don't know if that was the right decision or not i don't know switzerland that's that's that would be now cost of living there i think i think is very high that's, yes it, it is here also yeah that would be Switzerland's up there for us. We want to buy a place in, in Europe somewhere too. I, I think France is number one on our list. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I would say Switzerland is in the top three, it might even be number two on the list. There was a place called Nerja, Spain that caught my heart. I actually was going to go there for one night and then I couldn't leave. And so I got the, I asked for the hotel room for another night. And then the second night, I was like, "Oh, I'll definitely be okay leaving." And I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> leave. I stayed there for five nights. Oh, I really? couldn't leave. I was like, "I don't want to go anywhere else." Wow. And so that place caught my heart. And the thing that was interesting about Spain is it's super inexpensive, mm. and also you can rent a place uh, for just a couple grand and get something really, really nice. And if you go out and get food and drink, um, there's no tip i think it is no. or tax maybe and but either way it's nothing it's like you can go out and get a great meal mm -hmm. for like 20 bucks and get a drink and yeah. maybe even dessert yeah you can this that's <clears throat> the best part about when we travel because we travel in like an expensive way mm -hmm. you know rel relative to most people as far as we find and eat at the best restaurants that you could possibly go to still inexpensive relatively yeah. speaking no, it's i mean you could go to a michelin restaurant with a seven course menu and you're leaving there and you'll spend 200 to 250 dollars us mm -hmm. An expensive dinner but you know for two people that's not that bad we spend 250 dollars at the for, um the charles and i love the charles and there for lunch great yeah. but not a seven course no meal with a with amazing wine and it's so good and so affordable looking at homes like in france and in the uk you can rent and buy things for not that much money and get like you live in a villa well portugal was my original thought portugal i want to because go it's because also don't forget there's I go to the azores bad there's different visas you can get and there's also something called a um citizenship by descent so i'm looking into that because i have some relatives yeah that have gone back i even have Morocco. i didn't even know like we have relatives from morocco which i thought was really weird i'm i have a percentage of me that's morocco like, have you done 23 and me or something my sister like did that? and i just deduced that if, if she's officially <laughs> my sister which we kind of look alike everyone thinks that she's me with boobs so i think i'm good but i think she was like one or two percent moroccan Whoa, which i want to do that i thought it was pretty what well. else were you um just like english polish like kind of like a mix like a mutt but um but if you can prove and, and, I, and I don't want to speak too much on this because I don't know all the specifics, but if you can pr prove that there was someone that lived, mm -hmm. which obviously, how can you not? Like, it's not like I was born. I like, didn't know that was a thing. There's That's a thing. It's citizenship by descent. There's a guy who you should follow, um, Nomad Capital on YouTube. Nomad Capital, I binge watch his stuff. So you can more about, easily get like a another passport in a different country type of thing yeah, and get because citizens. i want to hedge my risk just in case like people eventually are sick of us being bullies here and people come and do bad things to us i want to at least know that i have another country i can go to yeah or finding a different uh, culture period that just oh. operates different than the i mean very few places i'm sure you can find communities and places in the u.s that like operate a bit different and the culture's a bit more like eastern mm -hmm. but there's some places in the world that you could live that I'm, are amazing. I'm sure, yeah. amazing. And it's, and it's not to say that different here is amazing, life but it's just different. Yeah. And to me, I get bored easy. I like different. I like change. So yeah. Did we transition back? We were talking about fear, and then like oh, think about it. There's gonna, this podcast will be all over the place. There's gonna be people that are gonna be like hearing about fear, freaking out, and hit coming up short on a triple. And then all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, you know, I had a two hundred fifty dollar meal in Spain, but it would have been five hundred here. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're taking you for a roller coaster ride. Moto County Podcast is definitely that's why we're the number one podcast in motocross. <laughs> Uh, King Friday, great, great question, which just led us into an hour of conversation that was completely unrelated to your question. We're going to do another one. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. We got yeah. Kenny C18. Uh, Kenny C18, you're within, you, he's got to be a top five, one of my top five favorites. Mm-hmm. But Moto Academy members are like children. You, you can't pick a favorite. That's unfair. <laughs> all, you have to like them all equally. <laughs> but with that said, you're in my top five, Kenny C18. Let's see what he's got. Unbelievable. Is he muted? Oh my God, but can you hear the question? No way. There's no way. He's legit mute. Is that? He, is he doing sign language? Hang on. Tony recorded it wrong. <laughs> so while we're working on this technical <laughs> difficulty. Hang on. <laughs> so while he is working, oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm handling this situation. <laughs> Hello? Whoa! Oh wow! Wait, what? He's on the speaker system. Can you hear me? Yeah, are we. Am I in the van right now? You are in the van on the podcast, but coming through my Bluetooth in the van, which is an interesting idea. It sounds great. You sound great. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, you're That's coming awesome. through like the the custom outfit speakers that they put in the back. Yeah, this is great. Uh, I could I could not figure out how to work those. Uh, I know. Up in Tomahawk. No kidding. I don't know how to work this van either. And I don't have to hold you up to the thing because you're coming through the speakers. Uh, so I, we're in, we're answering questions. You're on the podcast, Tony. So say hi. Hey guys. Uh, the Kenny C18 question has no audio. Did it have audio for you? And can you try resending it? Uh, maybe just text yes. it to me even or something. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll try to resend it. It did have audio for me. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll text it to you. Okay. All right. Thanks. Toodles. All right. See you guys. <laughs> Bye. Tony. All right. So Kenny C18, we're skipping you for a second. Uh, we've got Mike and Andrew. Mike and Andrew. Mike bought my practice 250 from last year that I rode at Jet and Hunter's place. So that's his current bike. Oh, wow. That's a nice bike. Are you freaking kidding oh, me? Oh, you know why? Because you're connected, connected to, the to the gosh darn Bluetooth. That's the problem. Oh my God. We are having technical difficulties. All right. Well, Tony's resending it for no reason now. <laughs> it's all right. Give him something to do. <laughs> Tony, this is Albert speaking. Disregard uh, it is because the phone was coming through the Bluetooth of my van that it wasn't working. So it was, a, it was a me problem. Got it. You got it. You got it sorted though. Yep. We got it sorted. Sorry. All right. Sweet. All okay. good. Toodles. See ya. Well, firing myself. I'm fired. All right. Mike and Andrew question. Now it's going to work. No, it's not. Cause I didn't turn the van off yet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, you don't have to turn the van off because it is off, but open the door and shut the door and that should click off the, uh, whatchamacallit. For those listening, oopsie daisy, I don't know how to work technology. Oh, careful, careful. As long as you don't hit the camera, that's the only thing that matters. Oh, dude, you got a stash. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, what? Dude, I just finished my Red Bull and I was a little oh. upset that I didn't have enough control. Take all of them, please. There's probably five cases under there. Maybe not. But yeah, take as many as you want. I'm definitely taking one out of here right now. Because Red Bull came to a couple of our events in Virginia, which is cool, with the Red Bull truck. And uh, all the guys, they, they kept giving us them. And hey, shout out to Red Bull Straight Rhythm, or Red Bull mm. in general, because think about it. Um, would you agree that in 2018, when we did that James Stewart tribute, would you not agree that that had some degree of influence over the trajectory of your career? Yeah. The James Stewart followed by the Pastrana. Yeah. Absolutely. And it came at the perfect time because I was trying to, that's like when the tour was starting for AJ Cat and Zero Moto X Academy. And it kind of got me on the radar enough to be able to sell classes, not just condensed to the, the Northeast. Um, which was the starting point. Yeah, without that, it would have been way more difficult and may, may, could have taken a lot longer. Yeah, so it was a good platform to kick things off. Totally. Still, still struggling. 
So maybe I shouldn't, maybe I spoke too soon. Wait, the King Friday. Didn't the King Friday one It work? did work. So play that again. AJ, King Friday here. So that makes uh, even less sense now. So now I got to call Tony back again. And, I'm calling, <laughs> and now, now I just called Hannah by mistake. Guys, <laughs> somebody send help. And just so you guys know, if you guys want to know what not being high level is, just realize that sometimes you can be high level, but sometimes you go to mid level. So what is it yes. like a mid level, AJ? Hey. Tony, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it, it turns out that it was, in fact, the clip. And the King Friday one that you sent <laughs> is the only one that has uh, audio. Audio. The that the Mike and Andrew question and the Kenny C eighteen does not have audio. Okay, let me try to send it a different way. Okay, thanks. You bet. Right. That is being high level. Oh, we're getting the King Friday question again. Whoops. <laughs> Guys, I'm giving up. I'm going to give up on the questions here shortly. Dude, you're definitely mid-level I'm, right now. No, I'm low. Mid-level tech low now. Level. You know what you are? You're you're consciously high level, but I think technologically you might be mid-level. I hope that people listening there's got to be because we're trying to describe certain things in so many different ways and ultimately that's like what this podcast is. It's just you talk for a while and you try to explain things a million different ways. And people can kind of get the gist <laughs> of what the heck you're, you're talking about. But hopefully along the line and along the way, they're, like this is going off in people's heads yeah. every once in a while, right? Because I think the, the big thing is to being high level is recognizing that uh, there's, there's the conscious and there's the subconscious. And it, all it is is if you can observe your thoughts that monkey brain just constantly chattering about God knows what, right? Before you go to bed at night, your brain just thinking about money that you do or don't have, the bills that you have to pay, what you're gonna do tomorrow, what you're gonna you know, do if this imaginary thing in the future happens. There's a lot of people, myself included years ago, I couldn't sleep and I couldn't fall asleep because I couldn't slow my brain down mm -hmm. because I was, all of those thoughts that was going on if you can take a step back and this is a good way to visual like i visually will take a step outside of that and look at it mm -hmm. and observe without judging <clears throat> not trying to avoid the thoughts but just watching them come in and thinking ah oh, that was interesting there there it goes there's just a thought it just popped up it's just a program that's just playing that's your subconscious and when you're the observer to that in observing it that is consciousness that is the conscious observing the, the subconscious mm -hmm. when you can actually understand that concept uh, it makes sense of all of pretty much all of the problems <laughs> that you could possibly right ah for sure because and, and i love how there's one thing you said about that which i love which is observing free of judgment because mm -hmm. that's when the ego kicks in is that's the judgment as soon as you judge you're right back into being in your in your body, which is your, you are now the, the subconscious. It, yeah. Yeah. As soon as you judge it, you fall right back in and you're into the program again. Yeah. And for a lot of people, actually not a lot of people for anybody, that is the constant practice of this because you have to, you have to be conscious. You have to be present. That's why the, the, uh, power of now book is so important mm -hmm. because it teaches you and walks <clears throat> you through so many different foolproof ways to kind of like get back into just being conscious, being aware, being present mm -hmm. instead of projecting some imaginary future situation or playing back some past event to try to predict the future. You know, you're bouncing back and forth between past and future. That's your subconscious. That's all that is. Like you can mm -hmm. view that and not judge it and just be there watching it. That's it. You can do the same thing like when you go for the walk, when I go for the walks in the morning, it's very easy to all of a sudden start thinking about a bunch of crap that you don't need to be thinking about. Or you could be really intentional and just kind of like enjoy it, just be really calm and still, almost like you're just like off and just like observe things and be grateful for little things, mm -hmm. the leaves on the ground or the birds or the whatever. Uh, instead of like going on that walk, but not being on that walk, just being in your subconscious. Well, that's oh, the whole crap. thing. I got to, my car doesn't have gas in it. How much does <laughs> gas cost? 
Yeah. Wait, what gonna, time am I supposed if, to meet up with AJ? What if AJ I run Trump? out of gas on the way to the gas? on the gas station what if uh yeah mm, i'm kind of hungry oh yeah you know what i got a headache my head really hurts um man my mouth is kind of dry like did i brush my teeth this morning like people just go oh, and yeah. go and go <clears throat> and so did i mm -hmm. and sometimes you can revert back into that but you can catch it right in the yeah. moment you can catch it kind of revert step back out observe whoopsie daisy fall back in judging myself again it's constant practice. Think about the worst. So let me ask you this. I want to see what you, how you respond to this. What is the worst part of thinking too much in that, in, in the example you gave when your mind is going all these places, what do you think is the biggest price that you pay for that? <clears throat> well, I feel like there's a few. One of them is that you are pulled out of the present moment. So you, you, you're not able to, that's why most of my early years, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. I'm sure if I do that mind control method and dive back in, I can I can pull up memories because they're there. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't conscious. I was go I was like a, a I was like a robot going through life, just anxious, nervous, uh, like boisterously overconfident, but not overconfident, like a cocky, mm -hmm. like an insecure overconfidence. Um, all of these egotistical, like self-conscious, subconscious things, that was my whole life. So I don't even remember much of it, which is odd. Well, the worst right? part of it too. So you miss life. That's what I would exactly. say is the ultimate. Yeah. So here you are always thinking about this next moment, this next thing. And then when you get there, where's your mind then? Well, on the next thing and then it's the next sad. and the next. That's tragic. So you're, you you're, you're, yeah, it's tragic because you're never there. Right. And that's why. I think a lot of us need to really be intentional about learning about Eckhart Tolle's, Tolle's work. <clears throat> Is it Tolle or Tolle? No I idea. still don't know. Mm, yeah, neither. I don't know. We'll meditate what, what, how on do it. You say it. it. Uh, I, I think Tolle sounds better. Toll to me sounds like I'm on the Jersey Turnpike, which by the way, shout out to the woman in the Jersey Turnpike who my wife called and said, hey, listen, we went through a toll. It was supposed to be 250. You charge us 50 because we didn't have the easy pass. She said, hey, I feel bad about that. We're going to reimburse you the 50. Shout wow. out to you. Wow. But anyway, so the toll to me sounds expensive and it sounds like it's a cost. So that's the meaning that I place on that word. Okay. So I, I say I call totally, it totally also. Yeah. Totally just to me sounds good. Yeah. But let, let's go back to it for a moment. So think about it. Most of the times we have conditions for when we'll be happy, right? I'll be happy when I win my first race. I'll be happy when I get a good whole shot. You know, I'll... <laughs> there's always these conditions for our happiness. It's like, well, why can't you just be happy right now? And I think a lot of times people think too much about their future. Now, I'm not saying that you don't want to plan for the future. You don't want to strategize for the future. Certainly you want to think about it, but you want to think about it in a way where um, you're excited about it. You imaginate it, uh, imaginate it, imagine it in a way that, um, that you're excited about it. So you elicit positive emotions that make the future attractive, but you don't want to spend too much time there, mm -hmm. you know, because if you're spending too much time in the future, then like, what is happening now? Like right now, you and I are doing a podcast and it's great, right? We've been interrupted by the solar guy. Um, we had, uh, <laughs> we've had more technology, but, but that's fun. And uh -huh. so as I'm here with you right now, what's cool about this conversation is I'm not really anywhere else. And that's, and think about it. That's why this conversation is enjoyable. You could easily, I could easily say, oh, well, I'm hanging out with AJ. AJ is cool. That's why this is fun. And sure, that's part of it. But really, <coughs> I'd say the biggest part of my enjoyment right now is the fact that I'm here. Not physically here, but like I'm I'm just here. My mind is not thinking about anything else mm. other than listening to the words that you say and providing as much value as I can to the people in the academy, right? Which is the reason a lot of people <clears throat> like dirt bikes in the first place is yes. because it does that automatically. Yes. In a way. It's like meditation. Yes. Everyone thinks meditation is hard. Go ride your bike. So if you can understand what is what's happening in that moment mm -hmm. and and be there and get there throughout your entire day. Uh, that's high level. Correct. Right. So, but it's a lot of practice and it's difficult yeah. because it's very easy. You're auto, you're, you're automatic to some extent. Uh, a lot of the books I read would claim that it's like 95% subconscious. So a lot of your subconscious, a lot of your programs <laughs> are, um, predictions of the future or approximations on what's going to happen in the future based on your past, mm -hmm. it's not current. The current is completely unknown, so that 
you don't have downloaded subconscious programs of the present moment. Then that's why it's so powerful though, right? So it what you guys have to realize is you have to you're going to catch yourself. It's not that you know some people will have to catch themselves and some won't. Everybody has to catch themselves <clears throat> because your subconscious program and these thoughts will what next time that this starts to happen think about it it's either something in the future or it's something in the past it's either a fear of something in the past you think of a future event you then become afraid because you remember a past moment mm -hmm. so you're bouncing back and forth between the two that's not when you are that emotion you're subconscious if you can observe those thoughts and think Oh, that's funny. My mind just made that up. But guess what? That's in the future. That hasn't even happened yet. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, yeah, my, I just, my mind just kind of brought up this thing. But that's in the past. That happened two years ago. Or that happened two minutes ago. Or two hours ago. Whatever it is. Uh, that's in the past. It'll never happen again until I think of it like this. And if I think of it like this, I don't have to judge it. It doesn't matter. It's actually gone. In fact, it's not right now. It's, it takes a while to get to that th that level of thinking, especially when you're in moments of like heightened, like driving and all of a sudden somebody cuts you off. You could go down the rabbit hole or you could very, very quickly just go, oh, this incident just brought up a feeling that I'm comparing to a feeling that I had in the past and that I should react this way by doing this. Because that's what I did in the past. It's just a program. <laughs> it's just a program. It's just a program. <laughs> and you can catch yourself constantly. And it's fun. Oh, because for sure. you get better and better and better at it. Um, I think the key is, as you get really good at it, the key is trying to uh, really, really make sense of it to every different person. Right? Because how many people do you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis that don't understand what a feeling is? Or mm -hmm. that don't know what the subconscious and conscious mind is, the difference between the two. Most people don't, probably, right? And you, yeah, and even something as simple as identifying with your feelings. Think about if you just did that, right? So if I <clears throat> feel hopeless, I feel weak, I feel confused, whatever it is I claim I feel, think about that for a moment. It, are you identifying with a feeling? Because if I feel like I can't do something or I feel uncomfortable, um, if you give that feeling, if you identify with that feeling, then it has too much power and control over you. You know, whereas if you just experience it and you realize that feelings are fleeting, you can quickly move away from that feeling. I mean, real quickly, within real a quick. second. Well, oh, within a second. Right? Because some, some people's refractory periods are hours, days, yeah. weeks, months where they go in, ah, 2023 wasn't my year. Huh? Yeah, that's a crazy saying. That's a horror. Huh? Or even just saying today, yesterday wasn't my day. Yeah, you you could argue that that's just as bad. That as, means you're identifying it. with the negatives, the negative emotions. You're you're identifying <clears throat> with them for that long. Yeah, and also it's not even true because if I said yesterday was a bad day, like what are the chip? How how much time do you? Th There's probably like one thing that went wrong, right? Or and maybe maybe even if it was three. If I said, okay, AJ, you had a bad day yesterday. Fair enough. But let me ask you this. What happened? Give me like the bullet point title, like the, the things that happened. Let's say you give me three and I say, all right, well, these three things happened. How much time did each one of those actually happen? And if you really asked yourself, first of all, the things that happened probably happened in a matter of seconds, right? But then when you describe it, you'll be like, oh, well, this thing happened. I mean, like it bothered me for three hours. No, no, no. I didn't ask you that. I asked you how long the thing happened. And if the, if the thing that happened, like where you dropped a pan or on your baby's foot, I don't know, whatever, you know, it's like, it literally was like a second and a half, but most of your pain was not just from the pain of what happened, but it was the suffering that you chose because pain you can't control, the pot drops on your kid's toe, that happened, you couldn't do anything, that's painful and it hurts. Uh, not just physically, but you feel guilty as a father, right, or whatever. But suffering is a choice because now all of a sudden you're choosing to ruminate on it and then make it a thing. And now all of a sudden this thing that was actually five seconds long or two seconds long, now that you've ruminated, like, oh my God, I'm a horrible father. I can't believe this. Allie's going to be upset. She's already yelling at me, like, oh my God. And now all of a sudden it becomes like this much bigger thing than it was, but it was like an experience that you had. And now if all of a sudden you 
grow it and you hyper focus on it, make it bigger than it is. Now all of a sudden you suffer, but even then it's still not a big portion of your day. If you're asleep for eight hours and you're awake for 16 in a day, you're still looking at only a relatively small amount of your day. So it's like, what about the other 20, you know, hours of the day or whatever the math is. That's why reflecting is so important because you can ask yourself a few of the right questions and kind of deduce that, oh, it wasn't a bad day. Yeah. Or it wasn't a bad year, or wasn't whatever. It, just ref- reflection and asking yourself the right questions will lead you to that conclusion. It's the people that don't reflect and kind of just get stuck. <clears throat> alarm going off, sh- trying to sh- slam the alarm off, going through mm-hmm. their whole day like it, it's Groundhog's Day in the worst way possible of just replaying the same Broken program. Yeah, same program. Or, or. Uh, it's... Yeah, that, and, and reflection. I want to help. I want to help all of those. That I want to get to the point where, I, like, I transcend motocross in the sense that I want to do more of like what you do, I suppose, right? And not just with yeah. athletes, but anybody. Let's try to help people with that while helping myself and learning. That's the beauty. Anyone I work with, as I'm advising my my clients, my mm-hmm. athletes. I'm also listening to them and then reflecting on that within myself. So mm-hmm. it's like two for one. I'm helping them, but I'm also yeah. becoming more conscious myself. And what's also selfish. great about what you yeah, selfishly, <laughs> um, but then selfishly as selfish as that is, it's also serving them as well. So that's why it's a good selfish because it's serving me totally. and it's serving you them. You want to know a really uh, subconscious place if you want to visit it one day or if you go often, you would know? Where? The post office. The have you noticed office. that? Do you go? How often do you go into the post office? Never. Okay. Go in tomorrow. I just, don't sell merch. Just That's go why in I tomorrow. Don't go. You're a merch guy. Well, no, I don't do sell my own merch. But, I, but like, if we give away a jersey or something fun, I'm I'm the one. Alley normally, but now I'm the one. You make alley package your shirts. Well, before the baby came, yeah. Well, it sounds selfish. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just go tomorrow. Really? All right. So go to the so, post office tomorrow and just, just observe. What just am I going to observe? Gonna, all right. So well, get, I'm, I'm not catching you. You're, Talk you're to me. going to see so many people. I mean, th- you can do this anywhere. I'm kind of just being facetious, but you, the automation yeah. of people, people Got getting it. in that line, uh-huh. and you can guarantee that those people are pissed off in that <laughs> line because there's a line there. Yep, because they knew there was going to be a line there, and then remember back to last time how there was a line there, and why they got and how they got mad, and they're going to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to get up to the front of the thing, and guess what? Something's going to go wrong. Yeah, guaranteed, it's going to cost more than they thought. Yeah, the printer is going to clog up for a second. The person behind them is then going to get mad that it's taking too long. The person has seven packages like I did yesterday, and it's holding up the line. It's a bunch of angry people reacting to things that keep are happening to them. Yep. And then the poor people on the other side of that that are actually working there. And there's one of the guys that is conscious enough and he knows how to kind of navigate. Yeah. And he, you could t- it's interesting. He seems like a good dude. Well, because he's observing their behavior. But the other employees there are right in the mix. So they're combat. They're, they're combat and the emotion. They're, yeah. they're yelling back at the people. So it, the, there's the one guy that's got it cool, calm, and collected. <laughs> and then everybody else in that place, for the most part, is a just a wreck and just mad about something. Yeah. Uh, it's really interesting. It's well, really interesting to watch. Because he's not taking it personal. Especially if you go in there at noon on a weekday. Because Are you talking about the one next to Olympic Pizza? Yeah. No. Oh. Uh, the one next to um, Plan B and that Oh, the big there. one. The big main yes, one, yeah, yes. gotcha. Which is still small and crappy. Which why are yeah. all uh, there's post only one cool guy there? Yeah, I forget his name. The African American guy with the dreads. He's, He's the only. Oh cool no, guy. I haven't seen him yet. Oh, dude, that there's guy a guy works. all the way to the right. Uh, in probably Indian guy. Really, really smart. You could tell he's smart. He just, because he doesn't react, he, he handles issues. He's a good problem solver. I've seen every time I go in there, there's another problem. And this guy is the guy that figures it out every time. Is he Funny. smart or high level? He's high level. <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. But yeah. then you question, well, if he's so high level, why does he work at the post office? But then you could be like, oh, you know, because it's just service to others. You're getting people's care, like loving packages and cards and mm-hmm. things to other people. And maybe that's what he loves doing. Or maybe he's not as high level as I thought. 
and he just secretly hates his job and shows up and just works a nine to five. And so this is now where you could get someone to argue with you because you could be conscious in high level, according to your definition, which is conscious, but also have a job that maybe makes 50, 60, 70 grand yeah, a year. That's why the, or, or and, nothing or, or, or $10,000 a year. Correct. It, because the, the money is irrelevant. It's just a byproduct that usually when you get high level enough in enough categories, the money will be automatic. Because you, your your service to others will be so valuable. Yeah, it's a byproduct. That the money will come. So mm-hmm. it's like a Joe Dispenza, mm-hmm. Tony Robbins, uh, um, Gary V, um, Jay Shetty, Ed Milet. The list goes on and on. Eckhart Tolle. All of these guys are probably rich. Yeah, and right? why are and why are they rich? They because they because they're they they offer their their service and so many people and help so many people and it's mm-hmm. it becomes so valuable that the mo- you make the you make the money mm-hmm. that's kind of my philosophy with moto academy is give so much do you ally is always trying to be like whoa 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 whoa, whoa. don't <laughs> yeah, don't give so much value oh i'm no i'm giving everything away <laughs> yeah i i pay for people for trips i spend so much money every year on just making sure that like we're doing team trips where I'm flying in everybody and mm-hmm. buying this and giving away this dirt bike and th- and spending so much of my time in the app giving away my time I could offer that service for the same exact amount of money that I offer it now and offer no direct message system very easily and I would probably have the same amount of subscribers or close to it I spend five hours a day <laughs> because I want to help people inside of that app. So eventually, even if it hasn't happened yet, although it started to, the re- the reciprocation of and the compounding of how big this brand will grow because of that mm-hmm. and how valuable it will become, it's inevitable. So the the money the money's there, even if it's not here yet. It's it's there because I'm it's he, I'm we're building it. Like the Moto Academy today, matter of fact, just surpassed my personal Instagram in followers, which I felt like was a cool turning point. Oh, for sure. Of like, wow, the brand that I've created, which started as a brand out of from my name, has now the Moto Academy without my name attached to it, surpassed AJ Cat and Zero. So you're over That's like 120,000 followers? I think it's 174, but oh, the wow. Moto Academy just hit a couple hundred more so just past it really yeah oh, that's wow. huge that's huge huge so that that means that now the brand lives on without me in my mind that's what mm-hmm. i consider it yeah right. you're giving yeah whenever you give and you give value you you almost always get it back i mean that's that's business that's like business 101 right like if you think about it like even when i provide more service than like what the cost of that service is exceed expectations yeah yeah because you you want the perceived value of what you offer to be greater than the value of what the the price that someone and not only is it the right thing to do and it works like to the core level of like laws of physics works Mm -hmm. uh it's it it is even easier to succeed because you're going up against uh, if you're looking at it from a competitive standpoint the people around you the majority of businesses and brands do not operate that way they mm-hmm. operate in how much money we can make can we make for providing the least amount of service possible <laughs> to somebody right that's well, true and so when you don't operate like that it becomes <clears throat> even easier to succeed i think yeah and think about so i'll even give you an example something that happened to me yesterday so i got our water tested cuz um we had a plumber come out for a plumbing issue and he's like, wow, we should really get well water. or are you city water? Well, okay. And so we got our water tested and we got the data back and all it was, was this sheet. And I spent like 110 bucks short, not, not a lot, but I got the sheet back and via email and I'm like, wow, there's always magnesium, calcium, hardness, softness, bacteria, whatever. But the numbers there meant nothing to me. It's like, oh, 25, 26. And I'm like, this is useless. This means nothing. <laughs> this is nothing for me. So I was kind of pissed. And so... I hit reply and I go, is there any way someone could like add clarity to this? Like, I don't know what this means. And this guy, Randy, like within seconds, it was really odd. Like I've never, I don't think I've ever had anyone respond to me this fast with an email. Uh, This guy, Randy says, call me. And I'm like, okay. And I called him right then and there. I called Randy. He talked to me for maybe three to five minutes. And I will tell you that I felt so much value Mm. that if you said, you know, who did this and all that. I I am going to be by their side for the rest of my years in this town. The advice you should have given him 
would be, hey, include in that email or whatever when you send that information back. Before you even on top of that information should be a paragraph that reads, please review, here are the exact test results. This is, it, this is exactly what this means. Mm -hmm. And if you need further clarification, please call me. I'd be happy to speak with you and tell you everything. Yeah. That'd be a level up. So then the people don't, so most people probably wouldn't then send that email and then they just get a useless freaking yeah, like, piece of paper mean? back and like, huh, this doesn't mean it. And you just move forward and you just wasted a hundred bucks. Yeah. And it was crazy what I learned. I learned that we thought our water was too hard. It's actually too soft. Mm. And so we actually need to go the other way than what wow. we thought. So I would have made a poor decision without that information and without that conversation. But why did I bring up that story? It's because if you want to make money, all you need to do is just find a skill that provides more perceived. And it's not always just value. It's perceived value, right? Like it, the, the value to someone who doesn't race professionally to, to become a better athlete. Watch this. What do you got? You got something. Sorry, I hate interrupting and I just did it so bad. Uh, this is from KTM is the best 737. Uh -huh. He asked, what is the best way to get sponsors as a broke 15 year old mid to top C class rider? And the reason I just thought of that is because uh -huh. what we're talking about uh -huh. is is in alignment with that. That thought process of like, giving more than just giving more mm -hmm. is a good philosophy to have for the getting sponsors thing. Like you need to think about what, how you can maximize what you can do for that sponsor. Yes. And if, sorry, I were completely diverting. No, I love it. No, it. let's go there. And if you're cool with it, not to be self-promotional, but if you go on the Behind the Best podcast, look for Jen Horsey, H-O-R-S-E-Y. Her podcast is one of our, out of 25 episodes, it's a relatively newer podcast, her episode that's is like blowing up and the knowledge she gives when it comes to partnerships. Now, that's one thing that she says. She doesn't call them sponsors, partners, because think yeah, about I it. Yeah, I don't like the word sponsor. Nobody likes that, but she she it's brought like up some case. crazy points. And and the, <laughs> the one thing that I think that people don't realize is think about it. What do I, so reverse engineer it, put yourself in my shoes. I'm going to sponsor this young man, right? Okay. Or, or be a partner with him. What's in it for me? Like, cause you always have to ask yourself what's in it for the person. And so, you, and, and if you, if you come back with what everyone says, which is, oh, well, I'm going to put your sticker on my bike. That means nothing. Especially if you're competing in Michigan and I live in Connecticut, like it doesn't mean anything. And the sticker, most of the time people don't even know what the sticker means. Or what were your results? from 2023 race season in the C-Class in Iowa at so-and-so yeah. -so series. Yeah, Does exactly. That, that's irrelevant too, isn't it? It is, but here, here is where anyone could crush it. If you, if, if you had the worst results in the C-Class, if you had the sketchiest bike in the world, and you literally never even landed any of the jumps clean, I wouldn't care because the value for me, think about what the value might be for me. The value for me, could be a couple different things. One, it could be, I like your character and I like what you stand for. So maybe there's something you stand for. Maybe there's something about your character that I see, but it better be blatantly obvious what that thing is. If I go on your social, I should see like, oh wow, this is like the dog guy. This guy rescues dogs. Like even if it's just that, right? You're the dog rescue guy. I wanna support you because of who you are. I don't care about your results because your results aren't gonna do anything for me anyways. But so I might or, wanna- Oh, this guy is, he didn't start riding until he was 20 and he's trying to turn pro at 25. Like that's an amazing story. And that, this represents X, Y, and Z that aligns yes. with our company. Story. So think yeah. about it. You just nailed another thing. So one, um, what kind of character are you? That would be my example of the rescue dog. Two, what AJ just said, story. What is your story? If you came from Nigeria and you came over, I don't know if you can get here on a boat, but let's say you took a boat and you paddled your way here and you brought your bike with you, dude, I would sponsor you in a second. Like that's a hell of a story. I do not care how you ride. We'll bring you to the auto, the, the auto academy, the moto academy. <laughs> we should, should create an auto academy. <laughs> the moto academy and AJ is going to get you squared up. I'd get you squared up. You know, so you always have to ask yourself what value do in, now understand that this is perceived value, not value, because I'm not getting a return on my investment financially. If I give you five thousand dollars to either of these two situations, I'm not getting anything back from the rescue dog guy. I'm not getting anything back from the Nigerian kid who started racing when he was twenty and came all the way over here to live his dream. But the value I'm getting is that I perceive that I'm a part of this journey. And so if you can get someone to join into your journey, into your story, totally. that is great. And even if you took it to another level and um, 
and maybe there was something that you you did uh, above and beyond that, but it has to be something specific, right? But it has to be some sort of value. It just can't be because a the more on a bike. specific you get, the more it's you, the more it's your story that is completely unique to you. Everybody has that. That's the best part. Yeah. Right. And- Mm-hmm. And everybody has that. I and I at first when I even began brand building, I didn't look at it and understand it that way. <clears throat> but if you can, if I can explain to anybody that you can provide so much value as even the worst rider to a sponsor, for sure, partner, it you could you start it. You need to first. There's a. You need to start a YouTube channel. You need to create your platform. You need to have an audience, and you can lean into whatever it is that makes you you. Like me, there's so many little things that I've done intentionally along the way that people would think, uh, like the way I open up videos and I say hello and I do this goofy, awkward wave, or when I end videos and I go toodaloo. Like who says toodaloo? A guy named Albert. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's all like. It's creating a character that people relate to or think is funny or entertained by. And in in turn, there's there's a lot of value to that. Yeah. Yeah. And it it doesn't even have to be much bigger than what you just said. Think about how simple what you just said was. Anyone Mm -hmm. could do what you just said. Would you agree? Yeah, that's the best part. Everyone, everybody could do it. Here's another thing. There's a guy who I'm a part of a program for like digital marketing for course creators, consultants, coaches, and uh, the program I'm in. The, the main guy who, by the way, has, as of probably the end of the week, he'll have 1,200 members at $97 a month in his coaching program. Nice. Do the math on that. That's a nice $100,000 a month paycheck. Yeah. Um, his thing is, he is super aggressive and speaks his mind. He'd be like, dude, this sucks. He will even get on the mic and get close, but like, this sucks. Do you understand this sucks? And you're just like, oh my God. But, and then he, he does that. So he's super, but then he also does it because he's so passionate and he will, he will not just shame you and say how much it sucks. He will be like, this sucks, but I'm going to tell you what to do. And then what he does is he's, and this is what his thing, like you do with the toodaloo, his thing is he has a um, empty milk um, gallon container uh-huh. of like this fluid and it's the exact same color as a windshield wiper fluid. And so he's always drinking this fluid. And then because he's drinking so much fluid, even on his podcast, he'll get up and he'll go pee and he won't even edit it out. And he'll go and and you're just sitting there. It's like nothing for like a minute and a half, two minutes. Speaking of which, I got to... Me too. Like but but that's his thing. And so the whole thing is like, just be authentic. Have a character. Have, have something that makes you different. And the reason why people don't want to do it is... Do you know why? Fear of... Criticism? Yes. Basically, Failure? other people's opinions. FOPO. It's called FOPO, yeah. fear of other people's opinions. Yeah. And that's why people don't do it. And that's yeah. the number one fear yeah. in modern day is people are afraid to speak their mind because they think they're going to get canceled. They think they're going to get shamed. People are going to judge them. And you know what? It just has to be <laughs> you. It has to, to be, be you. you. Um, yeah. You don't want to create a character that isn't you. So what I'm saying is like when I'm doing these dorky things, I'm not doing it to create a character that is a fairy tale character. I'm doing it to over-exaggerate and lean into like, me mm-hmm. i'm dorky yeah I've, I've i'm covered in tattoos but i don't swear i'll say butt instead of ass it even sounds weird coming out of my mouth mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm dorky and i i lean into that so as long as you're not like doing things and creating this character to get sponsors that is somebody or something that you know deep down that you're not that's a that's not a good road to go down that's but, authentic yeah but it has to be authentic uh and once you do that you could be a C-class rider. Did he say, what did he say? What, what's C-class. his specific story? 15-year-old mid to top C-class rider. Yeah. So, and what's good about being in the C-class is there's only one way to go but up. So you have a cool storyline right out there in front of you of your path to getting to a, a higher level of, of racing. But think about it's, the mistake be, he made in that. How did he, what did he lead with? He, he led, led with just the race results. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. so if that's not something that distinguishes you from someone else, that's not how you want to lead. 
right? Because that doesn't, there's, there's 10,000 people mm -hmm. that could send that same exact message. Yep. If he instead, do, I let's get say, that similar question all the time, all the time. Way. Yeah. And let's say that instead of him saying that he said, AJ, I, he didn't have to say races. You would just assume if he's in the moto Academy, maybe races, Hey, I'm looking to get sponsors. You know, my story is this dude, your origin story is everything. Like with me, I'm working on an ad for, um, my sports performance, anxiety, um, coaching group. And one of the things that's in there is my origin story. Like I have a limp because I over jumped a uh, jump at Middleborough. And the reason I over jumped that jump is because I didn't have a family that was willing to bring me to the races. And so I had one guy in my uh, family who was a cousin who said, Hey, I know you're got, you've gotten fast and you're practicing all the time and you want to race so bad. I'll bring you to a race, dude. Like I, I tear up even thinking about it. And I went and I, I literally had so much stress and anxiety that I said, the only way for me to succeed in this sport is to do well at Middleborough today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Do you, you, you guys, you think you have stress and anxiety? This is all I want to do. I want to be a professional motor, motocross racer. Right. So I'm like, this is the only chance I have. This might be it. So, dude, I held the throttle, hold, holding the throttle wide opening was not a problem. The problem was that it was too much throttle and I over jumped, crashed my, like, dude, sent for like the legit full send and crash. But anyways, so here I am with a paralyzed foot because of what happened. And so my nerves and my anxiety cost me. I paid the ultimate price. My dream was crushed. And why am I telling you the story? Because stories resonate and stories are how just that's how history has been told. And now what I do is I use that as part of my origin story as to why it's so important for me to teach young athletes about sports performance anxiety, because anxiety to me and the pressure I put in myself, I choked and I put way too much pressure on myself and look at what it cost me. What is it costing you? Right. And so notice how that story is important that distinguishes me now so i'm like oh wow now i get why this guy does what he does that resonates like oh wow that's like a and you, you can create the visual with it but story is everything think about it story is everything yeah and that's how you get a sponsor ladies and gentlemen that's a partner sorry geez louise partners aren't just for sex yeah, they're also sponsors for cash. sponsor to me makes me immediately think of um somebody in need that doesn't really have a a, a vision or a path um, which it, again, you can look at it, the, that word however you want, but partner, because you'd be providing equal or more value, hopefully more value to that. I was going to say sponsor partner. and partner quote it partner, then they're providing to you monetarily. Yeah, because if you're with product. Yeah, because think about it. They, we use partnership modern day for like relationships. What do you with Ali? What do you do? Do you have her, you know, give you a bunch of money and you just put a sticker of her face on the side of the motor truck? <laughs> Yeah, that's Allie, a you should be point. happy. Like, why would you look at <laughs> the sponsorship so differently than you would look at a relationship with a girlfriend? Because yeah, technically, partner. it's the same thing. Yeah, why are you so miserable, Allie? They're All fulfilling it. needs of yours. You're fulfilling needs of yes. them. You're working together for the a similar for a, goal. a common goal. Um, okay, let's see if we got our question audio correct here, Tony. Oh, we text them through, so this will definitely work. We got Mike and Andrew. <laughs> Hey guys, podcast question for AJ and Dr. J. Just curious how you guys balance the selfishness required to get good or great at something with selflessness, trying to cultivate friends and family and maintain that. Thanks. See ya. Wow. Whoa, well, that is very relevant to the selfishness conversation we've had on this podcast. So, mm -hmm. uh, Mike and Andrew, hopefully we've already sort of answered that question. I think we did. Uh, if right? we were to add, I think so, but let, what if we let added play, like a me, one minute? I want to listen to it one more time. Too. Hey guys, podcast question for AJ and Dr. J. Just curious how you guys balance the selfishness required to get good or great at something with selflessness trying to cultivate friends and family and maintain that thanks see ya okay so you want to start i have a good idea of what i was thinking if you have a good idea go ahead i know we covered a lot of selfishness stuff but i think we could add something a little more specific to his question go i think ahead. it it depends the answer to that would depend a little bit on 
uh, what specific thing he's talking about. Is he thinking about just the selfishness required to become a better person and spend time on, um, time on yourself, like, you know, by yourself, reading, meditating, whatever it is? Or is he talking about like getting better on a dirt bike? Because then you have to kind of think about the bigger picture of what's important. My family is important. Is riding this dirt bike serving my family in any way? No, unless you're learning the lessons of making yourself a better human by riding that dirt bike, then that's adding to the family. So I guess that's how I'd weigh it out in my head, right? Like how, whatever activity or thing that I'm doing that I'm trying to get better at, if it's flying a plane, riding a dirt bike, um, or just trying to become smarter by reading books, whatever it is, what value is it adding to the big picture, the family, the wife, the kids? Because yeah, then you can justify the selfishness and it's good selfishness at that point. Yeah. Does is, is the selfishness just self-serving or is it serving the greater good or the greater good of the family? And so the way that I would look at it would be probably similar to you, but maybe a little different where I would want to know if it took, if, and let's say we're just making an assumption here that let, let's say riding is to you perceived as selfish. Um, if you riding puts you in a better headspace to come home and let, let's just, a, we talked about how riding is oftentimes like meditation. It's like taking a gummy, right? So, um, so we talk about riding and the value it provides. Well, what if that value makes you become a more calm man, a more um, at peace man? And then that peaceful man comes home on a Saturday night and I'm like, wow, I get my peaceful husband or I get my peaceful dad. Now all of a sudden um, that selfish act actually isn't so selfish because now it serves the greater good of the family. Um, so even though you might be taking time from the family and time is valuable, well, what kind of impact does this have on you? Because the truth is too, that if you just do everything and do selfless, then all of a sudden you start to not be in the right mindset and the right mood to, to deliver and be the best husband or the best, um, you yeah, know, what father time you ratio. Be. It's it's is a moving, appropriate. I wonder. You're well, moving target. Obviously, it's a move. It's a pendulum. I always think pendulum, like you're just always moving. So you're going to move in one direction, yeah. where you're going to ride maybe two days a week, and then you're going to say, oh wow, you know, I didn't really need maybe two days a week. So maybe the pendulum shifts back to one. But it's a moving target. You know, not everything is always like an absolute answer or is always the right answer every single time. And that's why it's always in flux. I was just listening to a Jay Shetty podcast. And maybe I've talked about this on here at some point where he was talking about the experimentation in a sense of him and his wife spending time uh, long distance and living away from each other. <laughs> Ver like that's how the relationship started like where it was like, you know, six months apart or three months apart or a month apart. And then what he found is that after experimenting with all different times away and like in or time with the wife and time away in a week period, he said that he thinks that uh, two day two nights, two days a week, two nights a week was the ideal time of time by yourself and then time with your significant other for him. That could change for everybody. But I've thought that was interesting because I've done the same with Allie where I've gone away for weeks at a time, gone away for a day, I've gone away for you, you name it. And now what I found is I, I agree with that. If you're taking a seven day week, I think two nights a week, although it might sound extreme to some people, <clears throat> uh, I think that's a fair amount of time to to be away, to be by yourself, to be able to be the best possible person when you are with that that person. Yeah, and I can speak real strongly to this because my wife um, still has her condo and I've got my place and often she'll go check on it once a week. We usually are at that cadence of about one to two days a week where she's not with me. Mm. And I will tell you that yeah, when she leaves, I'll actually go to that for eight years, <laughs> as crazy as this sound, and you can call me out on this if you ever ask her. I don't know if I've ever missed it once. My guess is I missed it once or twice, but out of eight years of her leaving my house, I always go to the upstairs picture window. She stops as she's pulling out. She stops in front of the window. I wave to her and then I point towards my heart and then I 
point it towards <laughs> her. She does the same thing back to me. And so I miss her when she leaves. And then when she comes, I always make sure I greet her in a very excited way. If I'm sitting at the computer, get your ass off the computer, go down and greet her, you know, it, like show her an appreciation for you to come back. And what's funny is I don't even have to try to do it because it's it's naturally what happens. I'm excited. I'm like, oh my God, it's been two days. It feels like a week. And so that has served my relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me what I think is one of the top three things that has served my relationship, it is that. And I think that sometimes we take things for granted, right? If you live in a really big house, you know, you, sometimes you're gonna take it for granted. I used to have a Ferrari. I used to take that thing for granted. If you told me I could start that thing up right now, what I used to do sometimes, dude, I, I actually respected the hell out of that thing. I would sometimes yeah. literally in my garage, have my neighbor come over, Nate, you know, Nate. Yeah. I would have him come over. We would literally just sit with two chairs and I would just start the car up and just let yeah, it like, wah, wah, wah. It had like a, as well. had this wild, sick wild, exhaust. If you have it, enjoy it. Start yeah. it up, just listen to it. <laughs> but I also made sure that I didn't drive it all the time because I didn't appreciate it when I did. There were times where I would drive it like two, three days in a row. I'm like, dude, you do not appreciate this thing. I'm like, you're a dick. You're a straight up dick. You're not driving this car. And I wouldn't. And there were sometimes I would literally punish myself and I'd be like, you're not driving this car. <laughs> like, sorry, dude, you're not driving this car. And I think the balance for everybody is going to be different. Mm -hmm. The balance for everybody is going to be different based on your situation. But I think that's a good question. And it's a move. It, and I, I would agree that it is an always moving target because when you talk about balance, like what is balance? You're kind of, there, there's no such thing. Yeah. Right. You, your, just like success your focus <laughs> is where your like your intention lies where your attention is and wherever your attention goes there's everything else kind of gets left in the dust so there's not much balance you're sort of just doing this through life in a way i think the most important part is the fact that i even considered asking the question right <laughs> just the asking the question yeah, alone. as long as you're reflecting so aka asking the questions on a regular mm -hmm. basis you will find the appropriate amount of time to spend being selfish and then being with your your family yeah, and that's why I the other day bought uh, a domain. That's a high level. That's high level. Super high level. Super conscious. I bought a domain the other day called Pause and Ponder. Haven't done mm. anything with it yet. I just bought it. I'm going to turn it into a, a little mini business I'm going to test drive. But I thought about it and I woke up one day and I was like, oh my God, most of what I do is getting people to stop. Don't forget what the pause is. Pause means you're going from being unconscious to conscious, meaning like you're awakening for a second and being like you said, the observer. And then ponder is just to ask yourself a simple question. Mm -hmm. Like, am I balanced? Um, what am I focusing on? What am I, what's my vibe? What am I feeling? Um, should I be doing something different right now? <laughs> you know, like whatever, whatever it is. If you just, it took anything from this podcast and you just got better at pausing more frequently, which I actually have one client who's so flat out all the time. I literally have a black um, graphic that I'll send him with the pause marks on it. I'll send him that to remind him to stop. And then sometimes just ask yourself a question. Just check in with yourself. Yeah. Isn't it like definition of meditation is to observe, right? And that's what meditation is. So you, meditation doesn't have to be oh, um, like meditation. You could be with your eyes open walking down the street. And you could be having these thoughts, step back, observe them. That's meditating. As long as you're reflecting, whatever you want to call it, you're able to not attach these emotions to the thoughts that are coming up. No, you're not identifying yeah. with your thoughts. You're kind of like it's just a simple, breaking free. It's a simple concept, really. Super simple. It's a very simple concept. It's just a, a ver it's an ongoing lifelong practice for anybody, no matter how high level you are. And step one is being able to uh, observe, period. Right. Mm -hmm. And most, a lot of people don't ever really get that first step. Yeah. Right. You could, a lot of people live and die, and I don't think are ever really conscious for 99%. any percent, any amount of time. For sure. But once you have that, you know, once you have enough to be able to ask that question even and understand this answer that we're giving, I'd, I'd say you're, you're on a, you're on a good path. I don't know what I'm talking about, but that's what I would say. Uh, can he see 18? Did we get his yet? No, because his didn't no. have audio. This is this way a last question, then I gotta go to the bathroom. Me too. I clicked on the wrong freaking thing. I went back into the Dropbox like a total noob. Okay. Can you see 18? What's up, Moto Academy? AJ, Dr. J. Kavanaugh. Uh, my question today is pretty simple. It's just, is it possible to overanalyze your thoughts? And is that a trap that you can run into? Thanks. 
Great question. Great question. <laughs> he's young too. Question. He's young. He always asks good questions for a young kid. How old? He's got to be what seventeen? Not even. Uh, what the heck did he say? Either I guess way. that the other day he's nine. He's eight, in between eighteen and twenty. And before you even answer it, the fact that he's even asking this question, mm -hmm. he could have done so many other things other than took the time to grab his phone, hit record, and send that question in. He doesn't. I don't. I hope if you're listening to this, I what's his first name? Kenny. 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 If you're listening to this, I can tell you right now. You are just the fact that you're even considering the importance of this. If you stay the course and you listen to AJ or myself or do your own, grow, you know, grab Think and Grow Rich or grab Eckhart Tolle's or go on YouTube. If, you, if you're more of a listener or audio guy, just listen. I give you my word, and I'm sure AJ would validate this. If I even was close to asking a question at your age, I can't even fathom what my life would be like right now. I was a oh. late bloomer. You oh, you yeah. weren't, I don't think you were a late bloomer. I think you were, I think you're actually an early bloomer. I was yeah. a late bloomer. I was probably like 30s. Well, if you consider that the majority of people never get their period, blooming at any point is you're ahead of the curve. True. But for you so at your age- So don't be hard on yourself, first of all. If, it, if you think you, if you are getting old, it's never too late. Yes. I don't care if you're 90 years old. If you're still alive and breathing, and you want to be a better person, you can still be a better person and you can make change. Mm -hmm. uh, for him to figure it out at that age and to begin asking the right questions at that age is just a huge head start. For I sure. Mean, it's a, it'd be a 10 year head start on what I had. So why do you think we overthink? When you were overthinking, because you used to be a big, because you're a smart guy, which is a kind of a curse sometimes, mm -hmm. you probably can speak to what what causes overthinking more than better than anyone? Well, what? I think, uh, how do I explain this? I guess the best. I, I was those, I was the thoughts. I was so ego driven and so I was so ego driven that the, when the thought would come up, I was that thought. If I was angry, you better believe that I was as angry as that person could get. And I was being angry for a while because I was just angry. I wasn't observing the feeling of anger come up, analyzing it, getting to the root of the anger very quickly, and then letting that anger go away and not attaching to it. Um, I was it. If I was scared and nervous and anxious for a race, I was a nervous, anxious mess. Uh, my legs would get weak. I would feel like I was going to throw up or crap my pants. Couldn't tell which one was going to come first. Um, palms would sweat. I would feel just they couldn't eat, couldn't stomach food on race day. Now, what were you thinking about that caused all those visceral effects? I was thinking, uh, I, I was c combining future and past of um, worried about the next race that was coming up or the, the what, the, yeah, what the next race that was coming what up. What were you worried about the race? What was so worrisome about that? Like break it down even further. Um, I was worried about that I wasn't as good as all the people that were around me. That was one big thing, reading the jerseys and seeing that like I was trying to put myself before that race even started. I basically would mentally put myself in a finishing, finishing position. Then I would try to like visualize the race because I thought that that was the right thing to do. So now I'm into the past, like pulling up old bad memories and like visualizing the race out of all the bad memories that I've had from the past. So therefore you just feel like crap the whole day. So you are the emotion. You're over you're over analyzing it, but in the wrong type of way to where you're it. Mm -hmm. Where you can you can not over analyze it, but you can deeply analyze a feeling or an emotion from the observer perspective and that is a very positive experience. Very and in that case, I would argue that you cannot overanalyze it because you'll analyze it to the point where you figure out you get to the bottom of it, and then you let it go. Mm -hmm. And when you get good at that, you shorten the, that emotional refractory period from years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes to seconds, to where an emotion can come up. You can you can get through it in the blink of an eye in a second. That's high level. The levels to that would be some people have the bad year because they're overanalyzing and they are their emotions for that whole freaking year, right? Uh, and then there's every step in between. But the observing is uh, step step one, and that's the most important step. Yeah, and what I like to do, and I don't know if I gave this example 
before, but um, I like to observe the thoughts. So if you're thinking, um, be an observer of the thought, and I like to create a story around it. So the story I have always, for some reason, I don't know why, it's Beverly Hills, and, I'm, and I don't know why, it's Britney, Britney Spears. <laughs> I'm not even a fan. I think she's a train wreck, but I don't know why. <laughs> but I am the gatekeeper for Britney Spears' house. I do. I try to make it playful because cool. it just makes it more fun. So I'm the gatekeeper for Britney Spears' house. Uh -huh. So literally, you pull up off the main road, and you're a thought. So you are a thought coming to the front gate. And you're like the guard out front? I'm the guard out front. So I can't are you, control... Do you have to stand, are you like one of the guards? Like not in, that stiff. In England, where they just have to stand there? They don't Not move. that stiff and not a heavy headdress. Okay. Matter of fact, no headdress because I kind of want to get some color on my skin. It's Beverly Hills. Are you outside? Uh, I'm outside, you... but okay. I do have one of those little like little things that kids have when they're waiting for the school bus to come. I've got <laughs> one of those where I keep my sandwich in my Red Bull. Yeah. Okay. And I've got fancy sunglasses. Cool. So, <laughs> so do you have a weapon? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Okay. For but it's a weapon I only use with with Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so. <laughs> so so the, the analogy is this, when someone pulls up, I can't control the fact that people can freely pull off the main road mm -hmm. and pull up the driveway because the gate is where I'm at, but the first you know 20 feet or 20 yards of the driveway, anyone can pull up. So that's the thought. So the people that pull up are the thoughts. I can't control the thoughts that pull into the driveway. So you're kind to them. You don't yell at them to get off the driveway. No. You're just kind to them and give them advice on where they can go. Yeah, because don't forget, I don't know who's pulling up. Right. I don't know if this person serves Brittany or doesn't serve Brittany, you know, because I, I I'm the gatekeeper. So my job is, hey, who knows? It could be her stylist. It could be whoever. Right. So this gatekeeper. So this thought pulls up and then I say, does this thought serve us or not? And if the thought serves us, I open the gate and I allow it to come in. <laughs> if the thought doesn't serve me, I I kindly, kindly. and respectfully mm -hmm. say, I appreciate you coming. Right. Because you have to be kind. I appreciate the thought for coming and arriving because I can't control it. And you don't judge them for being stupid that they got lost. No, in the, because if you judge and you then you make it a thing. Now all of a sudden you've taken that thought and you've you've energized it with negative emotions. Don't, don't forget, positive emotions and negative emotions have energy. So anytime you apply emotion to something, you're essentially energizing it. So you're energizing either for the good or for the bad. And so I don't want to energize that negative thought if it's not coming to serve me. And so I'll say, oh, hey, so glad you stopped by. Thanks for coming by. But yeah, um, have turn around and uh, hey, thanks for stopping by. Have a great day. That's and a so, great that's mental I image. I resonate yeah. a lot with that. I could see myself playing out that same scenario. Yeah. Uh, Would you do it for Brittany or? Because I think no, no, I, mean, I, I picks, don't want you to take I'd, my job. I'd maybe pick somebody else. Who would you slightly pick? different imagery. Who? I wouldn't mind being the guy that just doesn't move because that'd be <laughs> difficult. And I'd like to practice to see if I could do that. Who? What, what, so if it were a famous person, where where would you be and who would it be? Okay, let's see. Who am I guarding? Uh, <laughs> I want to guard like Elon Musk's house. Really? Yeah. And I want the entry to be... Um, hmm, there's a couple ways I could go with this. I have a feeling because that my, my head just went to then English countryside and really nice cobblestone road. But I, when I think Ooh. Elon Musk, that's not what I think of. I think like a spaceship entrance. At, yeah, like I think he Tony lives. Stark. I think he lives in a box in Texas. Like no joke. Really? Yeah, he lives in like one of the units he makes. It's like a minimalist like box. Oh yeah, in yeah, yeah. Texas. I'm pretty yeah, sure. So I'm guarding that. Okay. <laughs> Guarding the box. But I like that because I think it's important for people to be able to create imagery in their head to yeah. make sense of 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 that. And you can, make, that's you can have fun is. with it. You think about it. We're having you, fun with it. And this. you don't want to run away yep. uh, because that's not what it is. It's not a thought coming and like trying to force it away. It's just under, it's just observing it and and kindly not judging it and just saying, <laughs> yeah. It's like hey, who yeah. Are you? Even a good even a good thought, you you can embrace it for a second. Stick yeah. with it for a few seconds and then, just, yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah. I mean, because it just will come and go. You don't really have control over that. You don't have control over the thoughts that come in your mind. You have control over what you do with them. Mm -hmm. Do they stay and go through the gate and marinate in your brain, in your mind rather? Um, or do you kindly allow them to pass through? And then the other analogy you can do too that some people recommend is uh, like a river. Imagine there's a leaf yes. in the river. Yeah. You probably heard that one. Yeah. 
that's a pretty popular yep. one. I like the gatekeeper one a little better. I, little I like the, fun. I resonate also with the river one because we go to Cotton Hollow all the time. And I just think about the fact that it just flows. It's infinite. It just really, flows. it just flows and it flows forever and it keeps flowing and it keeps coming. And it's interesting for, to just look at. And I don't know. Yeah, and that you, sounds out there. But. Yeah, and if you followed one leaf, then the next one comes, and mm -hmm. that's pretty much what thoughts are. They're going to keep coming, just like the leaves in the stream down the river, down the road at Cotton Hollow. Um, but you don't want to be like forcing them against, like pushing the leaf back up the river. And that's what some people try to do. Yeah. If you actually fight your thoughts, and you're like, oh my god, I don't want to think like this. I don't want to think this. I don't want. I don't want to think about crashing. I don't want to think about crashing. I don't want to think about crashing. You're going to crash. Yeah, because you just energize that thing. Expend. You spent so, so much, much energy, energy on all the wrong things. Yeah. So much energy. You just want to lean into it. Be like, oh, listen, my old voice is coming. Holy I'm, it's crap a moly. What? Where are we at? We've been going for a long time. All right, we should probably stop. We need, we're going to do another one. We'll do another I've one. I've already decided that. Even I haven't even asked him yet. Um, no. I'm going to sign off because I have to go to the bathroom so bad. I have to pee. Matter of oh. fact, I don't even think I get in the van. I might need help. Do you have a cup? If I stand up, I will pee in my van. <laughs> <laughs> if I move, if I cough... I will pee my pants. I think this is Toodles. Um, this is Toodles. Thank you guys for listening, watching. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Shout out Dr. J. Cav. We'll have another one of these. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Toodaloo. Toodaloo.